for our Board of Selectmen meeting for uh, May 16, 2017. Um, the time is 7.04. And before we begin our meeting, I'd like to welcome everyone to join us for the Pledge of Allegiance. <coughs> First item on our agenda is um, uh, how we have colonial power here to discuss the energy aggregation program. Welcome, Mark. If you would just read your name and, uh, and company for yep. the record, please. M Mark Capitona, Colonial Power, 277 Main Street, Marlboro, Mass. Tonight we're here to discuss the, uh, the current aggregation program. It's uh, actually, it, it's really good news for the consumer. Um, <laughs> it's the, the aggregation program is kind of run up against an anomaly that's happened in the market. I, I put in front of everyone uh, a little printout here. I just want to sh explain exactly what's going on, but at the end of the day, the good news is, is the town's made the correct decision to suspend the program and deliver everyone back to basic service for the lower rates. So everyone's going to get the best rate in the marketplace. But there's a, a, an anomaly. Mr. Chairman, just for oh. before you go into the what we're going to do, can you just give some little history of the program of South Wave New Selectman oh. and for the audience who's listening just kind of absolutely so what, the plan, uh, what it, we did why we did it absolutely no, no no question so basically what the town has ended into is it is a, a managed product that allows you to make decisions every six months every 12 months on supply it's working with the supply community um, in, a, in a much more uh, integrated way and in doing so, it, it hasn't locked you into anything, so it, it has allowed the, the town at this point to, to do uh, things that other aggregations haven't been, allowed, haven't been able to do. Um, in the past, we've, uh, there's always been uh, savings delivered uh, to, the, um, to the consumer uh, in this program. So what we're talking about is on everyone's bill, the supply portion of the bill only. Uh, it says Tewksbury Ag uh, slash CMAC, that's Connecticut Municipal Electric uh, Co-op. And they've been uh, the supplier since uh, last March. Uh, been delivering savings since then. Um, again, this, this program is to deliver the best pricing that we can in the marketplace. So the, the next piece of this is for, um, how do I want to say this best? Capacity is a cost associated with energy. It's a non-bypassable charge that is charged to everyone and it's a piece that makes up the energy. And on these graphs here in front of you, um, <laughs> you're, you're in the load zone called NEMA, Northeastern Mass, with a little bit of load in WCMA. So 80% of your load is NEMA. Your capacity costs are going up from 2015 and 16, 334% that we cannot, um, <laughs> we can't bypass. The problem is, is the way that National Grid is allowed to uh, procure their energies, they get to spread it over all the load zones. And I'm going to show you what the difference is on a later slide. That gives them a tremendous advantage over the, o only over the next year. So June of 17 through June of 18. And, and I'll, I'll, get, I'll get to that. That's the NEMA load. In WCMA, uh, down the bottom graph, the increase is only going to be around 250%. So ISO New England has been extremely generous to our uh, generation um, community, if you will, to the tune of $3.3 billion that we cannot um, bypass over the next uh, four years. Everyone in all the service territories is going to be paying that. So everyone in Massachusetts is, I should say, everyone in ISO New England is going to be picking up that tab. So something that used to cost in NEMA 0 .003 is now going to cost 1.2 cents to 1.5 cents, depending on your, on your load. So, and this is the next page kind of shows all the components, and in orange is your energy, uh, excuse me, is the capacity piece. So 40% of your price is now going to be made up of capacity. So what we can, what we can manipulate or, or help drive down the cost of is gone down from 70 to 48% during this very high capacity time. Doesn't give us a chance to, to, to actually drive down the cost of your energy. And this last page is what I really wanted to show you, is because it'll all make sense now. 
So National Grid has, this is their residential pricing. And if you take a look at the first column in May, and you can see for SEMA, WCMA, and, and NEMA, pricing is all fairly close together. It, 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 is, it is a little higher in NEMA, which I would expect to see, and some of it has to do with uh, uh, shoulder months. But 7, 8 cents for your, um, 7.8 cents per kilowatt hour. Take a look in June. This is when things, the new capacity kicks in. It's now 11 cents. All the way through the, now, the benefit of National Grid, they get to take all of these prices and blend them together on a, on a load weighted average. Their total price starting um, in June is going to be 9432, excuse me, starting in May is going to be 9432 because they can take all of these averages. In your load, I don't have the ability to do that because I have to use what's in your town. And it doesn't give me the, the ability to drive down that cost through WCMA and SEMA. As you can see, and I think it's, it's easiest to see because there's no socialization, take a look down on the industrial um, load. In, 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 in May, it's the third slide down, 642 in SEMA, 6 cents, and 68 in, in, in NEMA. And then we move over the next column when capacity hits. Take a look at the pricing, 7476, very close, 9 cents, penny, penny and a half, penny point four. Big difference. And that's where they can't socialize, meaning that's the price for the load zone. If you're in that load zone, you pay that price. In, for residents, for residents, they're allowed to socialize that. So what the town's basically doing is saying, we're going to take the benefit of WCMA and SEMA and deliver it to the residents. We're going to go back and get the best price we can because we don't have the ability in the aggregation to actually do this. Next year, this problem will resolve itself because SEMA's, SEMA's price, second graph down on the front page, is going to go through the roof as well. But that doesn't happen until next year. And then their ability to socialize won't be as, uh, uh, um, won't be as, as big. So we, we will be able to do something going forward. It's just the town has made the decision for the, for the betterment, basically, of the resident to make sure that they're getting the best price possible. So starting in with the August meter read, the program will be suspended. No one will need to do a thing. Everyone will be returned to basic service. At that point, we're not certain or not whether the, the state will give us a, a waiver, because they say if you suspend your program because of price, and we're not suspending it because of price. We're, we're suspending it because of what I consider to be a market inconsistency. We're not able to socialize, and grid is. So I think we'll get the waiver. We'll have to see what happens. If not, it will, just re, it, it will only re require the town hang the plan and vote on the, on the plan that's already been passed. Then we just refile so that we can get back out there next year. I know you guys have a full agenda. That's kind of, I'm happy to answer any question that anyone has. Come back and have, if, if you'd like to have another uh, informational sen uh, session so consumers can ask, they can always call Colonial at 866-485-5858. We're happy to answer any questions. I don't know if you have any questions uh, about what, what's going to go forward. Okay, uh, at this time I'll open it up to the board to see if any of the board members have questions. Johnson, do you have any? Um, yeah, just actually um, a couple of uh, questions for you, Mark, and thank you for joining us again. Um, every time you come in here, we, we learn something more about uh, energy and um, the vagaries of purchasing <laughs> you know, this type of, of uh, service that's obviously a necessity. Um, so I have two questions. The first is um, from what you described to us, um, my takeaway in uh, reviewing some materials that the town manager provided and some listening to your uh, narrative tonight um, is that the plan that we adopted as a community um, some months ago, a year ago roughly, allows us the opportunity to take uh, maximum advantage of whichever rate is, is most um, advantageous for ratepayers. We have the right within the plan to um, it, in your words, suspend 
the plan to give the benefit to the ratepayer. Is that a correct assessment? That's a correct assessment. The plan allows for that, and we can bring that back at a later point if the rates begin to go the other way. That, that's exactly correct, Selectman. There are other communities that, are, that have been in fixed prices right. that have paid over basic service for a year or longer. And th this, through, the, through your foresight, it has allowed you to, to, to not pay over basic service. So the, the second question, and we learned this from um, our experience when we rolled this program out initially, it goes to the area of educating ratepayers as to what's transpiring. Um, I know from my own firsthand experience that a number of residents um, contacted either the town hall or myself um, when we made that initial change with questions about what's this new entity or what's the choice I have um, and, and there was a lot of explanation that had to take place. So with respect to kind of re-engineering this to go back to um, the grid as the primary supplier, yes. what's the thought process of educating the consumers that something on their bill currently is going to look different in a couple of months? and ultimately it's for their benefit, but we need to make that clear. So how do we accomplish that goal? So we can, I, and I will take any direction that the board has. We're certainly willing to do a direct mailing to each and every customer in the, in the aggregation, letting them know. Uh, in, in past times, I've done a postcard. I could do a, uh, you know, questions and answers, kind of a Q and A. Um, I could put the material, we, we do have some time before the, uh, uh, it's suspended. I could put the uh, information in front of the, the manager and say, is this what you're looking for? You know, I, I don't know how much detail or not that we're looking to, to get out there. Lots of times, a simple postcard telling everyone that you know, the program is going to be suspended on, on your bill and I'm just going to say with your August bill, you'll, you'll now see basic service as your, um, actually would be your um, September bill. It would end with your November, excuse me, with your August meter read. You wouldn't see that until your September bill. But we can put all of that in writing and get a direct mail out to each and every customer. And again, I'm willing to come back. Uh, you know, the turnout was fantastic. If you wanted to have a, um, an informational center, uh, session or two, I'm happy to come back and talk to the general public. No so problem. I, I would encourage you and, you know, with the town manager's obvious guidance, but to, to kind of strategize on how to best communicate that. I don't think it needs to be a, you know, one page lengthy letter. I think it has to be very salient that we're making an affirmative decision to make this change for your benefit as a consumer and here's what is reflected in that change and why, right? Sure. There's, there's better rate for you to attain. Um, just because, uh, you know, in the interest of uh, making sure that people have clarity um, and understand the change in their bill. And I saw it firsthand. I spent a lot of time with residents who um, were concerned about what was going on when we went into the program. So my thought process is we're going to have just as many um, questions or you know, potential confusion over what's changed, why is my bill different um, with respect to identification of, of my supplier. Um, so just a simple, straightforward explanation of that I think suffices and how to get that out to residents. I certainly would defer to the town manager in terms of whether it should be a mailing or a combination of... Yeah, we could do a, a, a PSA on the, on the local yeah. TV, t you know, TV or wherever, yeah. you know, that we can hit them, an article in the paper, yeah. you know, as many different ways as we possibly yeah. could. But I, I believe that this was, a year ago, this was by far the right business decision. We got a lot of positive feedback from um, rate pairs in town. Um, I, I think all of us at this table were supportive of the plan and concept and the uh, execution of it. And what, what I think I hear you saying is that this step, um, while we're calling it a suspension, is essentially a continuation or the use of another vehicle within the plan to maximize savings for residents. And that's a message that um, I hope that residents uh, will hear um, as opposed to hearing the word suspended in a negative context in, in you know the, the thought process of well gee maybe it didn't work the reality is, is we're within the plan context from my vantage point we're maximizing the savings opportunity um, by using that suspension mode there is no question that your decision 
is the best rate that you can get out there in the marketplace for someone in NEMA. Good. No question. And I appreciate your assuring us of that. Thank you. So that's all I have, Mr. Crown. Thank you very much. Um, I participate in this program, and I just want to be clear, people had to opt into this program. Um, I know when I first signed up, it wasn't an automatic that the town gave us the ability to participate in this program. Is that correct? Um, so the way it actually worked was it's an opt-out aggregation, meaning if you, were on, if you were on basic service, you were automatically enrolled. If you were with a competitive supplier, you could always opt into um, to the program. It comes without fee or penalty to do so. So, so you may I have had with, opted. I was with um, a different provider. I was not on National Grid. Yes. And I opted into the program when you um, did this. So yes. um, I appreciate the information. I agree with um, Selectman Johnson about the outreach to people because it is important that people understand what this is and um, people are all the time at my house. I am one of the few, I don't know how many other have landlines, but I'm getting calls saying, hey, you know, because of new legislation and I don't want them to confuse the two because I had people saying, oh, is this the same thing? And ours was, no, we did this as a town action to get the best price. Um, it's a little bit different than that. So uh, to the point of clarity for residents, I think that that's important too. So if we talk about the option, um, but this is gonna automatically happen to their bill? That's correct. Th they won't need to have, take any action. All the drop transactions will be submitted for them. They'll just see it in, in August, they'll see a little notation that your uh, supplier is being switched back to basic service. And I can put this all in the, and then on the following, you'll see the new rate in with your September bill. And so that one of the things that I used to monitor on my electric bill as I was shopping vendors, basically, um, was I used to have to check my bill to make sure that they dropped. So I would just like people to remind them to also look at their bill in September to actually make sure that for some strange reason you don't have a one computer glitch and that person doesn't get dropped off because if they don't get dropped off, they're gonna be um, paying more. more. That's correct. So it's important for people, as we're notifying them of this, that they need to actually check their bill to make sure that it happens as well. And, and we'll, j just so you know, we will make sure, so there's a, a little technical, but there's this thing called a load asset ID and every one of the accounts sits inside that. So we'll make sure that all of those drops have been accepted we'll make sure ourselves, Colonial, yep. that everyone has been dropped and I can report back. You know, these are the ones that got kicked back because of a name change and so forth. Right. And I, I can deliver that information to the town, you know, to this board, yep. saying, you know, that we did get 100% uh, drop transactions. Okay, that's terrific. And I really appreciate this program and bringing it to our residents. So thank you um, very much. Thank you very much for your work. I appreciate it. Uh, Mr. Kelly. Um, yeah, through the chair. Thanks, Mark. Just a couple of questions. Um, the only impact here, or the only positive impact, is for the residents. This doesn't impact commercial or industrial. Is that correct? Everyone is going to go back. It, it'll, commercial, industrial, anyone that's on the program, most of your, your industrial load is already gone. I think, there's, I think there's three customers that have a G3 meter and two customers with a G2 that would be considered commercial, industrial. So those customers will also be moved back to the lower rates uh, uh, here as well. So positive impact on all three sectors? That's exactly correct. Okay, to Mr. Johnson's point, as far as suspend or manipulate, I like to use the word configurable, so it's a configurable change. Would the rate decrease, would that be indicated, Mark, on graph one, on page one? Is that the configurable change? Because the other two graphs, you know, we still see an increase, increase. Is that representing the decrease based on its configurable change? Uh, so this, the top graph is the NEMA load zone, and that's the, unfortunately, that's where Tewksbury, 80% of the customers lie in, in NEMA. And that's got the largest increase, the 334% increase. So there's a plant called Footprint in Salem that um, they pay $15 a kilowatt month ISO decided to give them that benefit. And for the first time ever, capacity is broken off. So NEMA pays more 
than the other zones. And you can see that by the line in the, the graph. So it's $6 in WCMA, and it's uh, uh, about the same in, um, in, in SEMA. But you're at 14 plus in NEMA. And you can't get around that charge. 80% of your town is going to pay that $14 charge. National Grid has an advantage. For the residential customer, they're able to spread that out over their customers in WCMA and SEMA. What I'm saying is, is the town and the, and the board has agreed, should take that discount. So I live in the city of Marlboro. I'm going to subsidize your rate. Oh, it seems like a no-brainer. Last question is, um, you certainly highlight a lot of pros. Have you ever done this before, made the configuration change and something? Um, what are the cons, right? What's the risk involved? Any potential? Have you done this before, obviously, correct? Abs absolutely. Have you ever I, never. I, so this is, uh, this is the best kind of quarterback I am. It's Monday morning. I know, what the, I know what the wholesale rate of energy is. I know what National Grid's g going to charge you. I, I can't beat it. Like, they're just, they're, there's, no way, there's no way to get around the, the subsidization that's allowed by National Grid. They're taking a penny off their price. I just can't do it. And in my opinion, aggregation is to bring more control to the, here as well as lower prices. And we're making the best choice in the marketplace. 9-4. Very good. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Chairman, for just... I think the one downside, just to, to uh, Mr. Kelly's question, uh, would be as if we have to go through the Department of Public Utilities process again, which means we'd have to file our plan, get them to approve it, which is more paperwork on our end, but that's about it. I would say there was an administrative burden if we have to go back through. I, I agree with the statement. We can live with paper, paperwork. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, I'm sorry. I'm just gonna... But you believe that we're going to be granted a waiver given the issues that you've outlined here that could prevent it. So there is a, the possibility. I am that hopeful. Not. I am hopeful okay. that our argument will be heard. Okay. If not, I just want you to know I've done this before with the, with the town of Ashland. Your plan is already approved, so they'll reapprove the plan. Okay. At the end of the day, you'll be able to get back out there when this inconsistency in the marketplace uh, uh, subsides. Which is a year. Which is exactly June to June. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Uh, you, you're welcome. Uh, the only other comments I have is that uh, if the, you could put some sort of summary together of what's going on, uh, I, I like the idea of the cards or sending some sort of information out, but instead of the town getting inundated with phone calls about what's going on, if you could send something to the town where we could upload to our website and say this is, you know, everybody's recently received the card or whatever's going on. And, Please see the website, and this will be an informational thing where we're going to have the whole description and why and what and what we're doing. And we'll uh, do the same on our website. Yeah, that'll be Chairman. excellent. Yeah. As well as on that card, it will have our number to call. The only problem is, as you've seen, on the, on the initial mailing, it had ours. But people are going to call you to make sure it's not a, a scam. Yeah. I, I can't stop that, but I, I can promise you our number will go on. It's just there's certain calls I can't. I just can't stop it from coming. Well, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. I appreciate thank your time. You. Thanks for the time. All right. The next item on our agenda is the uh, beautification committee switch box up. Mr. Chairman, can I just? Sorry to interrupt. Um, Representative Maselli is here oh, okay. for the Cauley Stadium discussion. I don't know if the board would want to move that up. We could do that. To allow yep. that okay. take place now. Yep. Okay. We'll have to wait through oh, several sorry. presentations. All right, so we'll move to agenda item number 11, and it's the Lowell High School Collie Stadium update. Um, so I'll start off, and I'm sure the representative may ha will have more to add or discuss. Um, just briefly, uh, I wanted to um, update the board about uh, the um, City of Lowell's process that they're working through to decide where to locate um, their new high school. Um, the city uh, has been looking at um, four options for their high school. Um, some of the options are to renovate uh, their current high school. Um, another is to uh, renovate and add on to their current high school. And um, there is one option to locate um, a new high school at the Cauley Stadium site, which is right on the border of uh, Tewksbury and uh, Lowell. Um, by locating uh, a new high school on the Cauley site, 
um, they would utilize uh, a parcel, parcel of land of approximately 6.5 acres that the city owns, but the land is located in the town of Tewksbury. Uh, the land was previously owned by the Alumni Association, and the Alumni Association for Lowell deeded it to the city. So that's approximately 6.5 acres would be part of the um, development if a new high school was located at, um, at uh, Cawley Stadium. Over the past um, month, month and a half, um, the city, uh, through a home rule petition, filed legislation to remove uh, what uh, is known as Article 97 conservation restrictions from the land. Uh, because the land uh, had um, utilized funding from the Commonwealth for um, recreation uh, grants uh, for, for the, uh, for the uh, stadium, um, restrictions were also placed on the land and the city needs to remove those restrictions in order to use it for something other than park or recreation purposes. Um, the legislation uh, sought to or seeks to remove the Article 97 uh, restrictions from the land that the city owns that's also located in Tewksbury. Uh, I think uh, that was uh, because the, the restrictions covered either the whole parcel and they weren't sure they did it either for, for, for safety reasons or because there were actually restrictions. So the uh, development of the new high school um, has not, uh, the location has not been decided yet by the city. I know they're meeting tonight, the council. Uh, I know they still have some due diligence uh, to work through. And a final decision, I believe, is going to be made somewhere around June 13th. Um, building the new high school will bring, I believe, over 3,000 students uh, to the area uh, of Cauley Stadium, plus 400 plus um, faculty. Um, we have not um, seen any real plans uh, for the proposed um, development, uh, but um, I'm sure that will come if they choose that site. Right now, I don't believe there's anything the town needs to do uh, except monitor the process. Um, they have um, high school building committee meetings in Lowell, um, um, and they have them during the day. Uh, that the city manager has kept me on the email list to let me know when meetings exist. Uh, we will send staff to those meetings to make sure we're monitoring um, the work that's going on uh, until a decision is made. Uh, but right now, I don't think there's anything we need to do as a community until a decision is made where the uh, location of the new school will go. If it is Cawley Stadium at that point, uh, we would want to be more involved to understand the impacts to our community. Um, specifically in the area of traffic. And we want to work to make sure uh, there is a mitigation uh, to Tewksbury uh, in order to uh, alleviate any traffic impacts. But right now, that's too early to, um, to say. But right now, uh, they're still working through their options. They have not made any decisions. Uh, legislation was filed, and I think the representative can probably speak more to that. Um, but it's, it's still uh, in the early stages because a decision hasn't been made really where to locate uh, the new high school, and I know there's um, debate and discussion in, in, in the city itself on what to do, um, and we'll keep monitoring that. Thank you. Representative, thank Bye. you for joining us tonight, and thank you for taking all our calls the last uh, few weeks that we've been <laughs> discussing this issue. No, uh, no, no exaggeration. I've had 200 emails on this subject, and uh, relative to the uh, location, and the folks from uh, Lowell, and I'm not trying not to generalize, have taken a position, a lot of them, obviously, it's geographical, in opposition to this location. I asked for this meeting weeks ago to give me some guidance as that bill moved through the uh, legislature. And that bill has moved through the legislature, and the Committee on Bills and Third Reading put some Article 97 language into the bill. The bill has now moved as of yesterday. As I said, I asked for this meeting weeks ago, and uh, I was told 16th eventually would be the earliest. The bill moved over to the Senate yesterday. It was engrossed in the House. Now, what does that mean? 
doesn't mean it's the end of the world. I could build through more quickly than that. But what it means is, in the beginning, as far as this bill was concerned, and I don't want to be overly dramatic, but I'm going to be very factual, they really tried to push this thing through without, well, they pushed it through without a hearing in the House, and they tried to get it through without any input at all. I've been in constant contact with the sponsor of the uh, article, although it's a home rule petition. The prime sponsor was David Nangle, and I told David Nangle, we will, as the town manager said, have some input into this bill eventually. And he said, gee, we just don't want to hold it up early in the game because we're not even sure this is going to be the location. But if you followed it in the paper, and I have very closely, and I followed it in the house, everything points to this location. But that's a guess on my part. In other words, the other day, David Nangle got upset because it's a district he represents. And so far, he's been, I told him, well, you followed it before you were against it. But anyway, uh, uh, he took a stand against the bill the other day after uh, trying to uh, get this thing through quickly. He's a good friend, and I don't want to destroy that friendship over a bill like this. But we do have a vested interest, and I think the town manager has taken the right position. Uh, at that point in time, when they decide, in other words, why fight it now if this isn't going to be the site that they pick? But from what I keep reading, it looks like there are a lot of folks who, on the council, who want this site. So from a half-decent politician, I would think in the final analysis, and I'm not going to bet on it, but I would bet that there would be uh, leaning toward this site. However, as I said, I got 200 emails, and Bobby O'Tyre got the same, I don't know if you got any, on this issue in opposition. So there's a strong group in Lowell who don't want to locate in this area, obviously. Most of them are uh, Douglas Road, Clark Road, in that area. And I represent, as far as I'm concerned, the whole town. And I represent you. Uh, when you decide what you want to do, uh, I'm going to follow your lead on this issue. And I think Bob has taken the same position. Where is the bill now? The bill's gone over to the Senate, but it gets a little confusing. The bill has been what they call engrossed. Does that mean it won't come back to the House again? It has to, by statute, come back to the House. It's now in the Senate, and Irene Donahue, the uh, senator from Lowell, and Barbara Italian, who's our senator, are now confronted with that bill. They can do a lot with that bill. If they want to kill that bill, or if they want to, under their rules, the Senate hold that bill up, or take some negative action on that bill, they can. And then when I get it back, I could probably do the same. Uh, but that's a very negative approach to this thing. I still don't know where you stand, and I agree with the manager. Too many unanswered questions. Uh, in the final uh, analysis, this may work out for everyone, but I just want to uh, keep our oil in the water and if you told me tonight, for instance, do what you can to kill the bill, I would. Uh, as I said this morning, someone said, I got a call, and someone said, oh, gee, it's not gone over to the Senate. So that's why I think a lot of people aren't here tonight. They think that's the end of it. No, we get it back. We get another bite of the apple. So eventually, I'm going to want you as a body to tell me how you feel about it? If uh, in the final analysis things don't uh, look like uh, there's something that you can uh, support, I don't even want to use the word live with. Support on behalf of the town, I'm going to be interested. I just want to keep uh, communications open, spoken with the manager, spoken with the chairman, and as I said, if it were up to me, the best of everything would have been to hold this hearing like three or four weeks ago because it would still be in the House today. But it didn't get out of the House until yesterday. 
and there are a lot of other people who took an interest. Uh, people who aren't even in our district. Uh, people from uh, the from Wellesley, Danvers, uh, because of the Article 97 connotation, and I know you know what that is. And uh, they just felt that there's some kind of a sacred, uh, and I agree with them, uh, language as far as that uh, article is concerned. So right now, the uh, the uh, chairman of Ways and Means, of uh, not Ways and Means, third reading, goes in third reading, put some uh, safety language in there, and I can leave that with you tonight. So if you have any questions at all, I'd be glad to answer them. Uh, if, let's say you have a mine, you don't want that bill to move. And I'm not saying that's the right way to go. The other thing that I think of, I will have a bill that's similar, I shouldn't even mention that tonight, going through. And that bill would be land that's worth a couple of million dollars as a gift from the state. So I'm going to have some legislation moving through. Uh, we're trying to time it so it didn't coincide with this. I think I talked to the uh, uh, legal counsel today. She'll have that moving through in a few weeks. And uh, so I'm going to be involved in the same thing. I mentioned earlier, have I seen rules go through more quickly? I've had them go through more quickly myself. Have I suspended hearings in the past? Yeah, but it didn't affect another town. It was usually just to expedite a piece of legislation that I have. But I thought it was important enough that I come down here tonight to talk to you. And as I said, the town manager summed it up very well. The uh, point in time is when uh, they've got, they pick the site. In other words, why go to war? And I'm not saying you shouldn't. That's going to be your decision. Why go to war when we really don't know if they're going to pick the site? I get a feeling that they will. But that's where we stand. And I'll answer any questions. I know everything about this bill. I think I know more even than David Nangle about this bill. We've followed it closely. I've had someone in my office literally follow it every day it came into the house. So feel free to ask anything. All right. At this point, I'm going to open up to the board. Uh, Mr. Kelly, do you have any questions? Uh, through Mr. Mr. Maselli, thank you very much for thank you. Uh, sharing the, uh, the insight. And just a quick question, there. so it was approved by the House, now it's going to land in the Senate. Have they had an open meeting yet, a public meeting, to, so residents could voice their pro and cons? Great question. No open hearing at all. And the chairman of the committee, of that committee, said that he polled all of his members, and I will double check this, told all of his members, and they were in favor of uh, expediting the bill. That wasn't until they found out the uh, complicated parts of the bill. So that came out of committee, uh, I don't see any recorded vote, but he says he did a poll and talked to them. He told, said that to Barbara, waiting for him to say that to me. He uh, took a poll, and all the members of the committee were in favor of the bill. Uh, so to answer your question, that will eventually come back to the House. But the Senate could hold that bill up. In other words, if uh, our senator, they have different rules than we had, wanted to hold that bill for a while, she could. And I'm not saying she should, but I'm just trying to give you the wherewithal here. She could. Ali Donny was asking for hearing on the bill. Uh, from what we hear, she's going to have a hearing on that bill in the Senate. So to answer your question, didn't have one in the House. It could have one in the Senate. I sent one of my guys over there today, and uh, from what she says, or her folks say, they will have a hearing there. But that would be contrary to how maybe the rest of the little delegation feels. And I'll, uh, if once we find out what the date is, I'm quite sure Bob is going to let you uh, Senator Italian's going to let you know, and we will also, but it will be in her backyard. Thank you very much. Thank you. First of all, thank you very much. I know that we've spoken about this as well, and I absolutely um, appreciate your interest in holding our interest of our residents absolutely. close to our hearts. 
So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, as this thing has started to unfold, and I know the town manager, um, when we first saw this, we spoke about this, and at first it was like, well, the site hadn't been picked, and we had asked him as a board to send uh, members of his staff to the building meetings, which unfortunately are during the day, so many of us aren't able to attend. Right. I believe since then, and I think that's almost two months ago, over two months, we've gone to every single meeting, and I want our residents to be assured that somebody is at that meeting kind of hearing so much to the point, and I think you can back me up on this, Mr. Montori, that the um, city of Lowell called and said, what, why are you guys coming to every meeting? Mm. And basically, what they're very trying, protective. <laughs> and I understand that, their point of view too. Um, and this is their project, so I absolutely do not want to step on the toes. I want to be a good neighbor. Um, it is their land. It is, it, while it is in Tewksbury, we have to be looking out for our residents if that's going to be the impact to our residents. That's very important to me, I know that, but it is their land. And we have to be careful about telling people um, how they can address their property and what we should be doing with that. I know as a homeowner, I wouldn't want somebody to block what I wanted to do in my home. And so similar spirit, I think that we have to approach this. Unfortunately, we don't have the decisions in front of us today to make the kind of um, action that you're asking. Right. I look forward to these um, hearings at the Senate level, and I'm sure that we will be on top of it. I'm sure your office will give us feedback to when those are. But unfortunately, right now, I do not see from my vantage point a clear path to say we should be doing this, we should be doing that. And sometimes the hardest thing for any of us to do is wait, but I don't think with this particular project we have a choice because it is our neighbor's decision and not ours. And what you're saying is absolutely true. And I'm in the, legis I'm in the uh, legislature thinking, gee, should I hold this bill up? And you know, uh, as you said, the uh, maker of the motion came over and said, gee, you know, I just want to get it through. Well, I want to get it through so that we're not adversely affected. But it's, it's a strange situation. I've been in the House for 40 years, and it's a strange situation. I haven't seen this happen before, where they're trying to do uh, something with this parcel of property. And part of it is an even in Lowell. So to hear them read the bill, when they read the bill, they have to do that. And it says, in the city of Lowell and the town of Tewksbury, and I'm saying, I keep explaining to my colleagues in there, really has, uh, we have no benefit to derive from this. What we've got to do is we've got to do, as you said, and uh, uh, Jay said earlier, keep an eye on it. Uh, follow it all the way through. And I would keep in touch, and we'll keep you informed, but, and the town manager did a good job. I think he summed it up very well. I would keep in touch with the senator, too, because it's going to be in her bailiwick. And as I said, I sent someone over to the Senate today. Uh, I know she let me know anyway, but just to be sure. And uh, they hadn't set a date yet for a public hearing. And there are other, I don't want to complicate the issue. They're, they're taking land by eminent domain, some commercial property by eminent domain. And that figures in that. And the lawyer for that owner of that land is the farmer city manager in Lowell. It's a real complicated uh, issue when you look at it. But I'll say it again. I'm going to be doing something similar in a couple of months. And I'm hoping to move this thing through as quickly as possible. It's more difficult in that we're going to be picking up probably, I'm, I'm guessing, about $2 million worth of state land if we can get it. And I'll be, I'll be filing that bill. I talked to the attorneys today. I'll be filing that bill within a few weeks. Thank you very much. And that points out what you said. And yeah. I just have one question, and I don't know the answer to this. And, um, but out of the Article 97, 
seven, the 6.5 acres is in Tewksbury, but it's a much larger acreage that they're looking at for this article. It is not just, I just want to be clear with people, it is not just this 6.5 acres that is land in Tewksbury. It's a much larger parcel of property that they are looking at. Absolutely true. You're right. Okay. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I have no questions this evening, sir. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank you, Representative. I, I've spoken to you numerous times on this. I have spoken to Senator Italian, spoken to Senator Donahue. They have told me they are going to have hearings on this also, so they've been keeping me in the loop. Um, as we've discussed, you know, we've had the town manager of Wall over here to meet with our town manager. Our senior council has been in discussions with the Lowell's council to discuss matters. They've been sharing information. We've had our town engineer involved. We've had numerous people involved. So we have been keeping a thing in it. And I know you did ask for a meeting earlier, but unfortunately we had our town warrants that were going through. So we're kind of going to get to the town business first prior to uh, <laughs> talk about a high school that may or may not be built in a location. Um, so uh, as you said, you know, there's a feeling that it may be, but it seems like there's a lot of opposition right. uh, against this. And uh, the fact that the man that filed the bill went out in public and stated that he's against it, uh, I, I, it just it makes When it you have your district confusing. rise up and out, that's his district. Yeah. And they don't want it. Yeah. But anyway. So, uh, but we'll keep an eye on it, and we Good. thank you very much. And thank we'll you. And we're reaching back and forth to you to our, have conversations. With always you. a pleasure thank to work with all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Uh, at this time, we're going to take a uh, two minute break um, and then we'll come back into session. Okay. Thank you. He's, he's ready. All right, we're back into session. Thank you, everybody, for allowing us that couple of minute break. Uh, the next item on our agenda is um, the Beautification Committee to talk about Switchbox Art. Please introduce yourself, Paige. <laughs> yeah, hi, I'm Paige Impink, and I'm here to represent the uh, Tewksbury Beautification Committee. Uh, I wanted to uh, explain that the reason that I'm here this evening is we have. Um, another applicant for a switch box to be painted in the town of Tewksbury, which is very exciting. This is a public art project that was started in 2015 through the efforts of the Beautification Committee, whereby boxes that are um, containers for signals in our community have been painted with uh, images that depict a theme, Tewksbury past, present, and future. So through the uh, work of the DPW and the Beautification Committee, as well as a collaboration with the Tewksbury Community of Artists, uh, we've been very fortunate to bring four boxes, uh, each with a different theme, to the community, and now we have a fifth candidate. So uh, the committee met last evening and reviewed the application, unanimously accepted the design with some caveats, which I'll explain. And the next step is for the acceptance of the box by the, or the design rather, by the Board of Selectmen. And at that point, we'll be able to move forward and notify the artist and work can begin. Uh, so just to reiterate, um, we, had, we have five boxes in the community that were available uh, to us through the D DPW. Uh, I'm going to do a review for the members of the Board of Selectmen who were not part of the committee at that time. Um, on the screen, you'll see we, had a we have a box at East and Chandler, which is across from the Senior Center and depicts the Tumac Airport. We have a box at Livingston and East, which depicts the State Hospital and also some design of the um, baseball fields. And what you're seeing here is a before and after. So they really have 
beautified the community and also become statements about uh, different things that have to deal with the town's history. International Place and North Street, this wonderful box which depicts uh, Captain Trull's march, really fun. And the box at Andover and North Street, which is the carnation uh, imagery evoking the history of the community. So the last box that was available was Andover uh, Street and Radcliffe Road, right across from the entrance to the Ames Pond complex uh, right next to the gas station. And uh, for obvious reasons, I think it was kind of the least um, uh, appealing box at the time. However, um, through our friends at the DPW, they've gone in and cleaned it right up for us. And uh, it's going to be a beautiful canvas for uh, the artist to do his depiction, which is uh, a proposed uh, tribute to Miko Kaufman who is a wonderful, um, was a wonderful chiseler, sculptor, sculptor uh, resident of Tewksbury who passed away um, this year and in 2016. And so the design is, is uh, planned to be done in a chisel-like um, format, evoking the uh, style of his sculptures. He'd like to use the switch box as a canvas to list the different works that are in Tewksbury, as well as a small biography. Now, um, the box will be in a gray tone with layers uh, getting slightly darker, so it won't be uh, a loud box. It will be very respectful and also uh, quite artful. Uh, the gentleman who is the artist is a graphic artist. He's a rep resident in Tewksbury. Um, we're very pleased to have his um, submission. Uh, so at this point, the only other thing I would say is the committee unanimously accepted the design. The caveat was that we communicate with the uh, partner of Miko Kaufman, Elsie Howell, which I had a wonderful conversation with her today. She is beyond thrilled that his image would be uh, potentially displayed in Tewksbury. He loved the community, in her words, and just was so proud to have his works here, and she said he would just love it. So I wanted you to know that that due diligence was able to be completed. Um, and so we just need an acceptance, questions, of course. Um, there's probably going to be, uh, at the bottom of this switch box, a quote that was in Miko Kaufman's book. It actually was underneath a photograph of the Wamasset Indian statue. And it is forever, we hope. And it's just poignant and I think would be very tasteful um, and evoke the positive messages that he had through his sculpture. Thank you. Um, at this time, I'll open up to members of the reading questions. Johnson. Just a, a question, uh, Mrs. Impink. Um, certainly, I'm very supportive, and I think uh, these have been a you know, very positive addition to the community, particularly when you look at the retrospective photos of the before mm -hmm. shots. Um, you know, the town has benefited greatly from this effort, and. Um, I certainly am in agreement with the proposal that you brought to us tonight. Just a general question, this particular location isn't really conducive to a lot of foot traffic. And um, has the committee given consideration to the fact that on the left and right side you're going to have narrative that virtually no one is going to have access to view? We did. That was a point of discussion in our committee meeting. Um, there is sidewalk there. Yeah. The uh, the thought was that cars that are stopped at the light would be able to read the list of uh, works that would be on the right side of the box, the right side of the road. Uh, on the left side of the box, not so much. These are points that will be discussed with the artist, of course. Uh, we don't want people lingering at the light too long to absorb the information, and we don't want to obviously cause issues. So the point size of his font will be discussed. Um, okay. 
as long as the conceptual design at this sure, point. Certainly, I mean, I, I again, I support the premise, and um, you know, I certainly will vote to favor it. But it, it will be difficult to actually appreciate the um, the words. Uh, we yes, we agree. The vantage point of a traveling vehicle. We also decided that it would make sense to have the uh, name of the artist, Miko, uh, more prominent on the design, so those that who, who are not familiar with who this gentleman is would be able to instantly be aware. Thank you. Strong. Um, I do not have any questions. It's just I have to say that I love seeing these around town, and I really appreciate the committee's efforts on this part. And if you all have done your due diligence, which I believe that committee does a lot of, I will support whatever your decision is. Thank, thank you. you for your work and thank, thank you. your colleagues as well. Mr. Kelly? I echo the same comments. Um, I'm not, I am new to the board, but I'm not new to the art project. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for caring and thank you for making Tewksbury um, beautiful. Thank you. And I just want you to know that we do join other communities, Stoneham, Somerville, Malden, Cambridge, who have initiatives just like this in their community. So it really is a wonderful way to bring public art to the residents. And the, the only comments I have left, Paige, that I was, I'm a member of the committee, so I sat there last night as we went through this, um, and the same thoughts came up about reading the things, but we'll be able to get photographs of it, and we'll be able to post them on, uh, you know, the website of here's the, the box, so it, the message will get out there, here's the artist, and uh, it's such a well-deserved honor to this gentleman who did so much for this community that this is, I, I couldn't think, I wish we had a better box, you know, in a better location, but this is what we have, and this is what, you know, the, uh, they're going to work with, and, uh, you know, it, I think it'll be, for what it looked like before, compared to what it's going to look like now, I think it's going to be a big improvement, and, uh, and I want to thank you for your work. Uh, one last thing before you leave, um, I want to thank everybody for the Beautification Committee for the cleanup day. Could you, I know it's not on the agenda, but could you give us just like a quick of how you, uh, how many bags and how much uh, was collected real Abs quickly? Of course. So uh, even though it was a rainy day, we had uh, upwards of 90 people participate in cleanup day uh, on May 6th throughout the community, which was a wonderful show of effort. Uh, again, through a collaboration uh, with the DPW, we had uh, residents collect bags and then the trash was, was collected on Monday. Uh, 119 plus bags were collected, uh, including tires, uh, electronics and other types of materials. Um, in addition, uh, I communicated with Chief Sheehan and five needles were also collected. So they're off our street, um, which is a great thing. And uh, people were enthusiastic. They were uh, sad, of course, at the amount of trash, but um, really have pride in the community and grateful that there are efforts out there and people who do want to see things um, spiffed up. No, I, was, I was very proud of the community as they came out. It was, uh, wasn't the nicest of days in the, in the morning. Got a little better in the afternoon, but seeing how many people went out there and how many bags were collected made me feel that much better about our community that that many people showed up to do the work and the care. So we'll do another one in the fall, and we welcome teams and uh, civic organizations. We had Tewksbury Girls Softball, we had Cub Scouts, we had the Congregational Church. Organizations are welcome to join. All right. Well, okay. thank you very thank much. You. Oh, do you motion? need to take a motion? I think. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, we do need a motion on this. So uh, at this time, I'll take a motion on the uh, switch box. Mr. Chairman, I'll offer a motion to approve the uh, proposed um, switch box at, on uh, Andover and Radcliffe. Okay. I have a motion. Do I have a second on that motion? I'll second that. A motion or second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Chair votes aye as well. So you have a four vote. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, uh, the third item on our agenda is uh, department goals and objectives. And the first person we're going to have is uh, Ashley from the Council of Aging. Mr. Chairman, I, we have a um, PowerPoint presentation with the uh, goals outlined. I've given each board member not only the PowerPoint presentation, but 
backup documentation behind that presentation of more detailed information. So could you just, uh, give me a name for the record, please? Sure. Um, Ashley Springman, and I am the Council on Aging Director. Thank you. Welcome. Um, so goals and objectives for this year. Um, the first is something that we've been working on uh, since I came, and we've had a lot of growth, which is exciting, and that is to continue to develop the Council on Aging's transportation services. Um, I'm sure you're all aware that in, I think it's been a little over a year, we got a refurbished nine passenger van from the LRTA. Uh, we hired a part-time driver up to 19 hours to operate the van. Um, we have gone from just a couple hours a week to maxing her out at the 19 hours, which is excellent. Uh, we do a Friday grocery shopping trip. We have about six people that go every Friday that otherwise would not have a ride to Market Basket, which is excellent. Uh, we have a couple of folks that just go for the social piece, which is okay too. Um, on Wednesdays, we have a trip that goes to Wilmington and that um, circles the uh, main plazas there right over the line. So that's been a pretty successful trip as well. Um, the LRTA, unfortunately, has been getting more and more overwhelmed with ride requests, um, which is, you know, kind of unfortunate, but um, based on um, federal funding, adults with disabilities take priority over seniors. So I unfortunately have been getting multiple phone calls um, more and more by the day of people who have been unable to get to the senior center and appointments and any other place that they're going. In anticipation of this, the LRTA saw this coming, it's not anything new, um, applied to the MassDOT Community Transit Grant Program, which they do every year, and were awarded 10 vans this past year. One of them is designated to Tewksbury. So we will be receiving a brand new van this summer, thanks to the LRTA, and that, are, that is their efforts to help us because they know that they are no longer able to fulfill as many rides and services as they have been. So we will be looking to hire one to two more drivers um, to run the vans. I did speak with um, Mr. Gay, who has a relationship with the LRTA, and he spoke with the director over there who said it is okay that we keep the old van. Um, typically, they're returned, refurbished, or they go to auction, uh, auction. So we will maintain both vans, which is a great thing. Um, the older one, of course, will be kept probably within town if we can help it. It has about 150,000 miles on it. Um, and the new one will allow us to you know, go outside of town. Uh, we do offer, and it really hasn't been taken um, advantage of all that much, rides into Boston and Burlington via the Drake at Council on Aging. So the LRTA has actually provided them with a van and a paid driver to transport people to medical appointments. So if I can get our folks to the Drake at COA, they'll take them in and out of Boston for us. So um, that one's a little slow. I think they just there were just never any options for folks, so I just don't even think they really realize it's there. So we want to get that information out as well. Uh, the last, uh, as far as developing transportation, is exploring the possibility of a volunteer driver program, and I know I brought this up last year. Um, there are programs uh, within Massachusetts, specifically one in the North Shore, that use volunteers and their own vehicles to um, provide rides to medical appointments. Um, I do have and I can send you the link if you'd like. Um, Mass Mobility has an instruction packet on how to put a program like that together, um, what things you need to do. Um, it talks about liability, it talks about reimbursement. Um, so that's something I'll be looking into. The other option for um, volunteer driver services is um, CTI uses senior volunteers. They have a senior corpse volunteer program. So we currently have some volunteers at the senior center who teach exercise classes. They are trained by community teamwork. They are overseen by community teamwork. This is just another branch of that, um, that program. 
and it's called Senior Companions. So volunteers age 55 and over uh, become friendly visitors within the community. Uh, liability is carried by CTI, and those volunteers are allowed to drive people. So that is another venue that I'll be exploring uh, with the help of CTI. And that's already up and running in other communities, so that you know, would, might be even a good transition um, to start. So those are the three things that I'll be working on for transportation. Um, the second goal for this coming year is to start the process of becoming an age-friendly community. Um, for those of you who are not familiar, um, this was an initiative that was started by the World Health Organization in 06. Uh, AARP kind of took over and partnered with them to oversee the um, United States piece of it. And what AARP does is um, they help identify communities who are trying to become age friendly. They facilitate enrollment, so we would actually be applying to AARP, and then they guide you through the implementation and assessment process. You can have the card that I keep getting in the mail. <laughs> yeah, that starts at like 40. <laughs> um, so basic you making us feel better. <laughs> it does. My husband gets it. I, um, so he, uh, there are um, eight domains that the World Health Organization identified as areas that could be improved. Uh, there's actually two domains that kind of surface after that were not thought of that you know you can also improve. So the eight domains um, are outdoor spaces and buildings, transportation housing, social participation, respect and social inclusion, civic participation and employment, communication and information, and community and health services, nutrition and public safety were two things that for whatever reason uh, weren't identified, but a lot of people are working on those as well. Um, the application process uh, basically entails identifying what the town is already doing to serve the seniors. Uh, we are doing a lot here in Tewksbury. Uh, we've obviously been working on transportation, um, any of the sidewalk projects, anything like that that's making the town more walkable counts as something that we're doing. Um, the fire department helps us with the brown bag program when we distribute it every month. Um, you know, we have the um, Senior Tax Work Off Program, which is a piece for employment. So we're already doing a lot. Uh, the next step is to come up with a five-year plan. So, and you don't have to even hit all of these domains. So what is feasible? What can we do in five years? And there's so much uh, that we have that we're already working on that that would just be incorporated into the application. Um, there's three, I think there's 351 cities and towns in Mass, and there's only 11 or 12 that have been certified as age-friendly. So we would kind of be ahead of the curve, which is exciting. So uh, that is my second goal, and that would just be completing the application, getting it out, getting enrolled, and just starting the process. Um, uh, on that as well, um, the Tufts Health Plan Foundation um, did a massive survey with the UMass Boston Gerontology Institute and did an examination and an assessment of every single city and town in Massachusetts. So those can be found online, so you guys might find it interesting. And it actually rates you on all these different areas and will actually help guide you in choosing what areas you want to work on. So uh, most people are using this tool as well to kind of identify where we want to focus our energy. Um, in addition to that with Tufts, they have a separate nonprofit called the Mass Healthy Aging Collaborative, and they are strictly there to help guide you and assist you in becoming age friendly. They'll help you with the application. If we wanna do a project and we can't find funding, they'll try to help you identify a grant. Um, that is their sole purpose. So they've also reached out to me as well. So we definitely have a lot of support and a lot of backing. Um, so it would just be a matter of, of jumping in and getting it started. And um, lastly uh, is to introduce and increase intergenerational programming at the Senior Center. So this is something um, that a lot of towns are doing. Um, there is a group called Bridges Together, which is a nonprofit, and that is their goal, is to create intergenerational programming. They do a lot of education within the community. Uh, in August, we are planning on having an intergenerational cookout. It is going to be free, uh, just going to be a barbecue. 
there might even be a dunk tank, there's going to be bocce, and it's just to bring everyone together. So um, grandparents, kids, grandkids, great grandkids. Uh, we're going to call it a celebration for the ages. And uh, Bayberry Assisted Living, their activities coordinator, is a photographer, and she has offered to come take family photos. So people will be able to get all their generations in one photo um, f at no cost. So that's nice. Uh, our hall was going to be closed during that time, so this was a nice way to use the outside for an event. So. <coughs> um, secondly, I've been working on a relationship with the schools. Uh, two teachers from the Ryan School who run the Kindness Club reached out to me and I met with them. They uh, were very interested in intergenerational programming and I threw an idea out there of something that I had seen done in another community and we're going to give it a try in the fall. And that is having the students um, interview seniors, learn what it was like back in the day. They'll go back as a writing assignment, they'll write a report, they'll draw a picture of the senior, and then once it's completed, we'll reconvene, bring everyone together, and they'll present it to the senior, and we'll have a pizza party or something like that. So that's a really fun event. I think it's extremely beneficial to both groups. Uh, you know, kids learn a lot, and the seniors absolutely love it. So we'll be trying to do that in the fall. And then lastly, in the spring, I had hoped to do it this spring, but I didn't get around to it. I would like to uh, build some raised flower boxes in the middle of the healing garden. And that's something that uh, kids, maybe Boy Scouts, could help put together, and then kids could help maintain. So that'll give seniors the opportunity, a lot of them live in apartments and condos, a chance to you know, have a handicap accessible garden you know, at their disposal to do what they want with. So I uh, look forward to that and um, any other ideas that you guys might have as far as intergenerational programming because I know the, the options, possibilities are endless. So those are my three goals and my objectives for the year. Excellent. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. I'm going to open up to questions. Uh, Ms. Starnick. Um, first of all, thank you very much, Ashley. I do have to say that I attended, I think, the quarterly meeting that you have with the, the, the team, coffee with the was, director, yeah. um, extremely well attended, probably not as well attended as the two chiefs coming to visit because they seemed very <laughs> excited about that upcoming event when I was there. Yeah. Um, but it was very well attended and um, it was amazing the amount of information that you provided to those um, people in attendance. So I thank you for that. Um, my only question, um, I am concerned a little bit about the driving program and um, liabilities of what that would actually mean. And I'm sure that if you are working with other towns, they've had the same concerns. So yep. I look forward to that coming forward. But I don't think that's something that we can just enter into lightly. And I think you understand yeah, that. Yeah, absolutely. And then my question to you really is about the um, age-friendly community. So what would be the advantages to us for having this? So similar to when we first went into the green community, at that time there were very few people and it allowed us and still allows us to have grant opportunities, but we did have to say, okay, we're going to do this, we're going to do yep. that. Um, we did have to come up with a five-year plan, but there was some benefits because not all of the things that were in there were um, easy things to check the box on. So right. what would be the advantage of that right. program? Well, I think first you're identified as an age-friendly community. So if you have um, residents looking to move into the community uh, in that age group, obviously you know that that town is committed to making it better for you, safer for you. Um, you're going to, you know, there's going to be a lot around. Um, I think too, I was thinking about this today, it more or less just gives us an excuse to just keep adding programming. Um, you know, I'm going to be meeting with the other department heads, what are we already doing, what can we do? Um, you know, I think it's just just a little bit of a push as well. I did, when I spoke with the gentleman from the Healthy Aging Collaborative, he did say that he's really pushing and working on with the state to eventually have that like funding opportunity for communities that have actually taken that step. So that might be down the road. It's not there now, um, but that's something that he's working on. 
I'm not suggesting that something has to be there. I just wonder. Yeah, no, but that's just another. Yeah. That's just another. I'm benefit. assuming if we apply for a grant, it will put that on there, and that'll look good too. So. Right. Right. Okay. Thank you very much. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you're welcome. Mr. Johnson. Um, thank you. Just one question. I'm curious. As you, um, first of all, I'm, I appreciate the goals and I support them. Um, I will echo Mrs. Stronick's commentary. I think I raised this last year. Yeah. The liability piece, we, we had an incident um, not related to um, Tuxbury just a week ago in Billerica um, where, you know, driving is a serious concern, yeah. particularly when there are a lot of people in the area. But um, it, I think we have to be cognizant of that. And if you're borrowing and, and taking um, policies from other communities that have addressed it, I'm sure, um, when the time comes, we'll properly vet that. So yep. conceptually, I'm not opposed to it. I just want to be very careful yep. about that. Yep. But my question goes to, um, as you formulated these goals, how do you go about that thought process? Who do you engage in terms of um, other constituencies within the Council on Aging, and the yep. Senior Center itself? And how does that percolate to your settling on these three as opposed to some other ones? Yeah, sure. Uh, so we're always, you know, since I've come to the town in the senior center, I'm really in a constant state of development. I'm, I'm kind of in that mode. Um, we're constantly adding support groups. We're constantly adding programming. I've added a few more exercise classes. So it was um, more or less what were the bigger ones, what's going to take you know, the most amount of effort and time. Uh, the transportation one was obvious only because our phone has been ringing like crazy with the LRTA turning people away. Um, and that's just, that started a while ago and it's only been getting worse. So that's always been a major issue and something that I have addressed in previous years and it's gonna continue. It'll probably be in my goals next year. Um, the age-friendly community, um, that's just a project that um, I thought would be beneficial. Um, I did incorporate the board. Um, they're interested. Uh, one, my outreach worker, Nicole, is currently going through the gerontology program that I completed, and uh, she did a project on the age-friendly community, and she's done a lot of the interviewing of the department heads um, already. Um, and then intergenerational programming, that's the same thing. That's just something that I see um, being introduced a lot of different places, and there's, there's really no negative impact you know it's all positive and there's several things that I can bring together to, you know there's multiple objectives to this larger goal so I really just picked things that are gonna take me a year or two to you know achieve and uh, the other things I kind of just do as we go along okay, thank you. Yep. Okay. Mr. Kelly? Um, thank you Ashley um, I'm gonna plant the seed it's not on a three here but just to talk about the senior tax um, work off program mm -hmm. So I know that's been very successful, and I know kind of we couple it with the veterans in town, yep. and we average about 23 or 25 folks per year. Um, I'm starting to get some calls around that. It seems like it's generating a lot of awareness. Um, have you filled that to capacity for the last, I think it's been three or four years that it's been in existence, that program? Yeah, yeah we touched base on this. So that program is actually run through the HR department. Yep. Um, but yes, it has been filled to capacity. And um, we have also get calls throughout the year. It can be even close to June 1 of people um, calling, asking. And if there is funding available, they do find a place for them, a placement. But yeah, it has been filled to capacity. I want to yeah. work with Mr. Okay. So, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, just on that, um, we have funding uh, that was approved at town meeting um, in May that will be ready to roll out the program sometime after July 1st. Uh, we have additional funding, I believe, from previous years that um, uh, we're going to add to that. So what we do each year is if we uh, have enough applicants to fill the jobs and we need more money, I go to the fall town meeting to get the money. Um, so we've, we've been able to take care of anybody that's applied and who has qualified. Uh, so that's not been an issue. Uh, and qualified is the key point, which is they have to meet the, uh, the, um, the requirements set forth for um, um, in financial and um, um, owning a house, things like that. Uh, so we have been to capacity, and I think we've taken care of most people that have, uh, if not all people that have applied, and thank we'll continue you. to do that. Awesome, thank you. I know it's a big hit, so all right, thank you, Ashley. All right, well, the only thing I have to say is uh, you're doing a wonderful job. Um, I enjoyed that coffee also. Um, I did talk to a bunch of the residents down there. 
and they brought up the point about the concern about the ride. So the second shuttle, the second bus is wonderful to get that through there. Um, it's um, having both of them handicap accessible would be a big benefit to that. So, um, you know, I think you're doing a wonderful job. I made the joke down there while we are there that you shouldn't call it the senior center, you should call it the activity center because you have so many programs running for everybody down there. So listening to them talk about <coughs> going on a cruise, we're doing this, we're doing that, we're going on movies, it was, it was, I, was I was exhausted listening to it. <laughs> and, uh, so the fact that they have that much to do and everything's running smoothly, that's great. Uh, my uh, office still stands that uh, when you do your August cookout, I'll come down and uh, join you. Uh, I'm sure we'll probably get a couple more volunteers if you need them. Um, and uh, thank you very much. All right. Thank you. All right. Uh, the next is uh, Diane. Can you just give me a name for the uh, record, please? Diane G. Russo. I'm the library director. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it. I always have fun talking with you all. Um, so Ashley thought about goals that would take her a couple of years. Richard told me to write goals that I were achievable. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I did that. Um, being aware, of course, that we do have a long-range plan that we're working on that ends um, in 2019. So we'll start in FY18 um, doing uh, <clears throat> community interviews and those kinds of things to find out what, um, where the library should be moving in the next five years uh, after that, starting in, in 2020. Um, so the short quick things that I think we can accomplish this uh, fiscal year, in addition to what we usually do, excuse me, I realize the, um, we, we would like to revise the library's website. It's, I know it doesn't sound old, but it's three years old, and it needs to be revised. Um, we are working with Virtual Town and Schools, who's the vendor um, who um, creates our website and the town's website. Um, and we're actually asking for a facelift and um, to uh, adopt their new responsive design um, platform. And a responsive design just basically means that whenever you go to the library's website, it will fit on whatever device you're using. So if you're looking at it from your cell phone or your laptop um, or your computer at, ho at home or work, it will size appropriately, appropriately. the pages will size. Um, and we also are going to be relocating some content so that it's easier for patrons to find. And, you know, a lot of this we find out as we roll these things out and um, patrons ask us where things are and we're like, well, it's obvious to us where this is, but we're librarians, so no wonder it's obvious to us. So um, we're always working to make things easier for people to use and to find um, within the library um, and on our website, which is our online extension of the library. Um, we uh, are also very excited to um, use this responsive design since we know that 40% of our users access us via a mobile device of some sort. And um, that's, <laughs> all I can think of is these people are so patient because they have to look at these tiny things and hope their finger hits the right, you know, or they're constantly resizing on their device. So um, we're excited to do that. We're um, trying to, trying in vain right now to find a date to meet, um, but schedules are busy and um, we're getting ready for the summer reading program as well. So um, we have a lot going on. So um, that's one of our goals and the reason we'd like to do that. Um, the second goal um, is related, you know, in terms of um, making this, this information available to library users, um, but also me. Um, and what I'd like to do is to um, preserve the condition and access to the trustee minutes, which um, are not necessarily in any one location within the library or online. And um, so right now, we're working on inventorying them, um, organizing them, uh, our next step will be to copy them on acid-free paper and bind them. Um, but before we do that, we'll have them scanned um, in a searchable format so that um, people can use it online or we can actually use it online when we're looking for information. Um, 
to answer a question that the town manager sends every once in a while. <laughs> I'm like, uh, I don't know that answer. Um, so, well, I'm gonna make the next library director have an easier job with this kinds of things. Not that I'm going anywhere. Um, so the third one that we're going to do is, um, has been on my list and on my list and on my list. And um, you can tell it's not my favorite thing to do. So it's still here. Um, so, but we, we do need to um, maintain and plan for the, um, the reason I don't want to do it is because it's increasingly complex and it's hard for me to always understand because technology is not my personal um, skill set. I mean, I can use it really well, but planning for it and, you know, all of the tiny details are not um, anything that I even want to pay attention to, which is why um, we hire people to do that. <laughs> because it is overwhelming, I would spend every day troubleshooting and trying to get things to work. Um, so, we, um, we received funding this year in FY18 to hire a technology librarian which is a position I've been looking for. Um, this person will oversee technology and help me to create a technology plan. Um, but also, we're, right now we're teaching classes to the public in a kind of um, patchwork, piecemeal kind of way. Someone might need to, we're like, oh, people are coming to us about eBooks, so we'll do some eBook classes, or we've got a resource that we want to um, increase usage, like Freegal, the you, where you can download music, our eBooks, you know, those kinds of things. And, um, but, and we also have people who need help getting a, a, an email address, um, you know, those kinds of things. I know it's hard to believe in this day and age, but there are lots of people who don't have access to computing equipment, the internet, or um, anyone to teach them how to do that. So um, this position would help us to better plan that service and those services. Um, and this position is also a supervisory position as a professional librarian. And um, you know I've been working on um, increasing our hours open. And we do meet our hours open requirement for the state but we're not back to the hours that we were when we were first cut in 2007 and 8. Right now we're at 59 hours a week. Um, when we were cut first, we were at 64. Um, if I, not if, when I open on Thursday nights again, sometime in FY18, that will add another four hours. So we'll be open uh, 63 hours a week again um, for our residents. Uh, four evenings, Saturday, and Sunday afternoon during the school year. So um, I'm hoping that this will um, help to meet the need that's out there. We turn people away every Thursday at 5 o'clock and tell them Wilmington's open and Bill Rick is open. And, you know, and it's, it's disappointing for them and for us to be able to say that. But I've had to approach um, reopening and um, restoring hours in a very strategic way because it costs money. It's, very, it's expensive to be open. Um, and that's because we have to hire skilled people to um, be there to help uh, our patrons with their research questions, um, you know, finding a book they need, you know, those kinds of things. So um, those, uh, that position will help me to do that because I'll have another librarian who can be the supervisor on duty at night. Um, so, those are my goals and objectives. Those are really like activities, I think, for my objectives. Um, but I do want to take just one second, I promise, to thank you all for your support of a fully funded library budget this year, well, for FY18. Um, it's been many years, and, and I know I told the Finance Committee that I never thought I would really see a fully funded library budget. Um, not that I didn't have hope, but I just didn't expect that it would happen, I don't know. It was one of those like, don't dream it, not too much. Um, so I do appreciate the support that, um, that you gave Mr. Montori and uh, when he presented the budget that the Finance Committee did. Um, but really I have, to, I have to thank my staff because they provide good service. They provide excellent service actually in a lot of ways. Um, and are you know, out in the community and are serving people and meeting their needs. Um, and that their hard work allows me to advocate for them and for library services. Um, in, without them, I, 
I wouldn't be able, I wouldn't have a leg to stand on. So um, I do appreciate the work that they do. Um, I appreciate the support that you give us. And um, I look forward to um, seeing what's, what kind of fun things we're gonna do in 2018. Um, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Kelly. Start with you. Um, I, I don't, just a comment. So that's really good news as far as the, um, the technical and slash qualified life. Mm -hmm. It mm -hmm. comes with the time, so it seems like, you know, now with the time, so that's, that's good news. It's no longer a simple, you know, making sure that the computers work. It's software and it's applications, it's online, it's physical work. And it's what's it's complex. Out of the pipeline too, to do research and yep. exactly. No, that's, yeah. That's, that's cool. Yeah, we're looking to make an app that you'll all be interested in once we have an idea of what it's going to be. I mean, we know what it's going to be, but I can't announce it yet. So, <laughs> but you're going to like it. <laughs> um, first of all, thank you and your staff for all their hard work. Um, I think that we are fortunate in this community to have an active library that not only provides um, reading and technology, but um, I have many friends who go there for the activities that you're um, see. And I've gone to a couple of movies with some people. <laughs> movie night is very popular. Movie night, I don't um, get it, but okay. <laughs> It's <laughs> wonderful. People talk about it. And, they do. They love going. Um, I know that I was there for the market basket, and I think you had to oh, have that yeah. several times, right? Yes. Took yes. A, by popular demand, we. Yeah. yeah. It took me a couple times to get yeah. into that. So, <laughs> I just want to thank you all for your work. I am curious um, about the. I'm very excited about the techno <clears throat> uh, technology librarian. Yeah. And. Is there an actual cert for that, or is this somebody who has a librarian cert who has a strong technology background? Um, both. There's there are um, there are librarians who really prefer technology, um, and have an affinity for it. Um, and but there are also there may be people who have an affinity for libraries who have more of a technological background. So the we're going to be flexible in terms of the kinds of requirements that we have. But I am um, I am requiring an MLS okay. um, and some and skill with technology. Um, um, one of the the um, things that we do require is for every hour that we're open, we must have at least one professional librarian on staff um, because the, those are the people who can run the building and know and should know um, the answers to questions and how to find things for people and how to solve problems when I'm not and there. Have you started looking for that position yet? I'm putting the, the job description together right now okay. and yeah I expect it to go to um, HR this week and then we'll talk well, about that. That's very exciting. I wish it's, you a lot of it luck is. with that. Thank you, Thank you so you much. Yeah, much. I'm excited. You're welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for joining us again this evening. That's my pleasure. And my goal tonight is just uh, very, very quickly one item. I want to kind of continue a discussion we've had for a number of years because I don't think it's an issue that we should <coughs> ignore or forget about. And while, mm -hmm. um, like you, I'm very proud of the fact that um, we've been able to sort of climb out of the hole and get us back to respectability. Um, I continue to be concerned about the potential that should the economy turn or um, state uh, revenues uh, maintain their current state of affairs and the legislature uh, potentially be forced to cut local aid again. Um, right. I don't want to see Tewksbury's Public Library <laughs> fall into that um, need for a waiver right. Um, right. as we have for so many years. Mm -hmm. Um, mm -hmm. So to that point, um, I know you were kind enough not too long ago to share with us some communication mm -hmm. um, that the Board of Library Commissioners was considering some modifications. And right. I just I yep. wanted to ask if you um, could share any uh, progress or mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. sight lines on where that stands. And um, I certainly intend when the time is right and our uh, delegation members are with us again um, at the state level to remind them of this issue because I believe it's not a Tewksbury issue, it's a statewide issue. And Absolutely. there's a you know, programmatic mm -hmm. concern mm -hmm. that we have to address um, yeah. with yep. the retrospective <clears throat> piece of it. 
So can, yes. you, can you just update us on, on where that stands sure. you know, from your perspective, yeah. from an informational um, point of view? Well, I'll give you what I know and then I'll maybe share my perspective. Sure. <laughs> um, That's fine. So um, there, there have been some changes. There was a, a commission um, maybe that completed its work two years ago, perhaps. It always, time flies more than I imagine, um, and who made some recommendations to the Board of Library Commissioners about the state aid program. It was specifically to look at the state aid program. One of them was, um, that did pass, um, was to be able to count um, the amount of technology that we purchase in libraries toward our, um, toward the, the requirements for materials spent that we're that we need to do um, and that was that was ex so exciting for someone you know like me who spends um, money on software um, but also money on hardware that runs the software that can't be recouped anywhere within the state um, requirements um, another one that um, affects us but really affects um, um, summer communities more is um, the ability to choose which nine consecutive months you um, have to meet the hours open requirement. Um, in the past, it has been from uh, Labor Day through Memorial Day. Those are the nine months you have to be open your full hours without a waiver or you know those, that kind of thing. Now, um, for places on the Cape or out in the western part of the state where they, they rely on tourism, they can use their, and they're open more hours in the summer, they can use their summer months and, you know, fall and spring instead. So that works out really well for um, many libraries, and it doesn't really harm any libraries at the same time. And that's one of the, um, one of the goals that the Board of Library Commissioners tries to accomplish with any change that they make is that they won't harm any libraries while they're trying to improve their services or trying to improve the um, state aid program. So then I was, um, I'm very vocal, so I was asked to be on a <laughs> committee to look specifically at the waiver process. And um, I so am. We appreciate that. Yeah. I couldn't get anywhere, but, um, uh, however, the, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first thing is for most cuts in communities, and I'm going to say cuts under 5%, 5% or under. For most of those kinds of cuts, a waiver process and uh, the threat of loss of certification encourages the community to put that small amount of money back into the library at the next possible opportunity because they don't want to have to be on a waiver or you know, lose, potentially lose their certification. When you're cut with I'm going to say really anything over 5% is a fairly devastating cut. When you're cut with 10%, 17% like we were over two years, that's a devastating cut. That was over $300,000 that we were cut. And that is not, that is not an achievable, you know, you can't just all of a sudden make up for that in the following year unless there was some egregious, you know, um, you know, cut to the library, but not anybody else, or, you know, increase to, you know, the fire and police and DPW and nothing for the library, that kind of thing, where they're going to just say, too bad, you don't have, you know, you're not certified anymore because you gave the library a disproportionate cut. In a case, you know, like we had where there were other departments cut as well, it wasn't, while it was disproportionate, yes, um, it also um, was so large that there was no way within the next couple of years even money could have been put back. And there were some very good reasons for the cuts and there were some economic reasons, there were some town um, political and town need reasons, I understand that. But what that makes is a very difficult situation. And while the board wants to encourage towns to fully fund their libraries, they can't make them necessarily. Um, they can take away the stick, which is state aid to public libraries. Um, and if you're not certified, you don't get any. If you're on a waiver, you get a percentage usually of that. Um, the, the outcome that this committee came up with was, 
more stringent. <laughs> so, so um, however, it did at, at the very Good least. Work. Yeah, <laughs> thanks a lot. Yeah, I will say I was one of like 20 people, okay, who did not necessarily agree with me about um, this whole topic and how I've actually approached it. Um, these also were not libraries that received such devastating cuts. Um, so I'll just leave that there. However, I understand the, the um, reasoning. For most, what they're requiring now is you, you're, if you're cut, you have a sort of a free year, right? So you, nothing happens to you that first year. Um, the second year, uh, while you're doing that though, while nothing's happening to you, you're coming up with a plan for how you're going to work your way out of mm -hmm. this waiver or this budget cut. And um, it's a, essentially a five-year plan. And each year you go, well, I, I said this is what we need to do, but we'll see. Um, each, you share the plan and then um, update it with the Board of Library Commissioners. Of course, they can say, we get your plan, don't worry, we see that you're making progress, you don't have to come see us again. Um, or they can say, mm, I don't know how this is working, it's been, you're on year four of your plan and nothing has happened, you know, kind of thing. Um, what the, the positive part is, if you can make your way out and you get cut again, the, the whole process starts at zero again. So you're, you've got that free year to figure out what you're going to do. You know, so it doesn't mean that you don't have unlimited waivers. It just means that the process for going through them and trying to work your way out of them um, is um, compressed. At this point, we can be on waiver we have been on a waiver for 10 years, 11 years. And there's nothing that says we have to be off of that. As long as we're meeting very minimal requirements, we can be on a waiver for the rest of our lives or until the board says no more. Um, they're unlikely to do that. They don't want to hurt libraries with this process, but they also um, want to be able to take into consideration a situation where there was sort of a a, an economic need, a, an, an employer in town closed, their business closed. That's devastating for a town. Um, or it was just like, well, we didn't, we really felt like this department needed more money than the library. You know, there's, there's a, there are different reasons for these um, cuts to libraries. It's not what I was necessarily looking for. I really would like to get rid of the historic look at, um, at our budget. I would love for them to figure out some way to use services and um, the quality of services as part of the, the um, certification process. Right now it's purely money and it's purely historic money. And so when you, when you have a library or a, a situation that Mr. Montori and I have talked about where we might lose two or three um, our highest paid people and we replace them with people who start at the lower end, we're, we're possibly in trouble because we're not going to meet our MAR, our municipal appropriation requirement. So th there's still a concern and it's a concern for everybody. It's a concern for the Andovers and the Westons and the, you know, and the Lawrences and Lowells and Haverhills of the world. It's a concern for any kind of major cut to your budget about, you know, it's a concern about going on to a waiver, even for something that's just like not in the, in the control of the library or the town. So there are, I think there's, I think there's still work that needs to be done um, and I, I won't give up on it because I, I do think there are better ways to do this. However, this process is complete for right now. <laughs> in five years, they'll look at it again. And, um, you know, perhaps in five years, you know, I'll have been able to get some more people interested in my point of view. Well, <laughs> Besides to, you all, who have been so wonderful. <laughs> to respond to that, I, I believe personally that it's a legislative issue that has to be dealt with at a statewide level above the Board of Library Commissioners. And I appreciate some of the comments mm -hmm. that you made and examples that you, you offered here tonight. My larger concern is really about, because we've lived through it. Yeah is the catastrophic, you know, we, had, we yeah. had the Great Recession, which affected everybody. 
um, in a very dramatic fashion. Mm -hmm. You, you yeah. cite 17% cuts in our local library budget. That's the kind of example that drives me to say there's something wrong with the system when you need to re queue and right. the system won't allow you to do that because of extraordinary circumstances. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, after we got through the Great Depression, long before I ever walked on the earth, um, right. th there were major reforms to right. give people a clean slate. And in my opinion, to have the um, residual impact year over year over year of um, a dramatic economic downturn in our community to me is um, counterproductive to the purpose of public libraries. Mm -hmm. And that's why I repeatedly am bringing this up. So Absolutely. we're kindred spirits in the context of trying to address the issue. Right. Um, I believe it's a, a legislative solution yeah. over yep, the I would commission agree. level mm -hmm. um, uh, mm -hmm. to address it, but I don't want to lose sight of it, so I appreciate it and I, uh, yeah. I'm glad to have your, um, your um, you know, monitoring and mm -hmm. participation mm -hmm. and more importantly advocacy for, yeah. for some more positive solution. For some change. There is a new, um, the um, director of the Board of Library Commissioners is retiring mm -hmm. and um, a new person has been hired. I don't recall the exact timing, um, but James Lonergan will be the new director and I have some hope maybe that we can move forward with yeah. that. It would be nice to Less see entrenched. Uh, you know, we're blessed right now to be able to say we're close to yeah. restoration mm -hmm. of where we were, but mm -hmm. no one has a crystal ball. And in a, a few years or a little ways down the road, we may be faced with similar circumstances. And that's hopefully the, the spade work that we can do now to prevent a repeat of what mm -hmm. we lived through 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. thank you. I don't mean to thank get you. off No, no, course, that's fine. I, I'd be Always fun talking to you about this. <laughs> Sorry for the rest of you who are probably bored, <laughs> but it is fun. Well, I, I just want to thank you once again for showing up tonight. Welcome. My wife and children are there all the time. I think they know, I know. everybody there by yeah. first name. So uh, they love <laughs> the library. I'd like to keep it going that way. Um, thank you. Hopefully we'll be able to fund you continuously. And uh, I, I did check out your website uh, <laughs> to, to check it out. I, yeah. it's, uh, we need some work not only to the library, but to the town yeah. website. Yeah. Yeah, we're, gonna do, yeah, we're, we're working on that. Too. to the town hall. Yeah, so yeah. So, uh, we're, yeah. We're working on those As part of, of our to trying to get and, everybody together. And it, and it, it does sound like three years is just a day ago, but with technology mm -hmm. today, everything just goes that much quicker. And, uh, mm -hmm. you know, I, my kids are on the nooks all the time, downloading books from the library yeah. and doing those type of things. But, yeah. you know, they, they prefer to go to the library than the movies. So that tells you how much Well, they can nice do both at our library. Yeah, there so. you go. <laughs> Oh, but to, get yeah. teen, to get teenage girls to that. say, I want to go to the library, it's, that's, yeah. uh, that's saying something for the I have a teenage girl who so. doesn't want to go to the library. No. Well, they <laughs> so love, I get they it. They love going there. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. Thank you yeah. for you and well, all your staff active. that what they do. So. Thank you. Well, we'll work very hard to continue to provide yeah. good service. And, and um, with an increased budget, I think we can continue to do that and add more instead of having to just maintain yeah. Excellent. what we've been doing. So thank you. Well, well thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right, next we have the fire department, Chief. Sorry. <laughs> Good evening. Welcome, Chief. Would you Thank you. Read their, their name for the record, that's all, if you would. Michael Hazel, Fire Chief. Thank you. And <laughs> the f goals and objectives that I have uh, for this year, uh, there are four. Uh, the fourth one is actually just there because of Mrs. Stronach, um, that she wants to make sure that I always bring up that the, we need a new center fire station. So we do, and it's there. And thank you to you and the community for your support in that, in, in the favorable vote that we got at town meeting and at the special I think election. That my colleagues so. joined me on that, but I appreciate <laughs> that. My father will be very happy to hear that. Um, just going, going down the list here. For 2018, uh, the, the first uh, priority and objective um, and goal for the fire department uh, and myself is, is the, the purchase of a new fire engine. And that's to replace a 1994 engine. We, we last year in our, uh, my 17, FY17 goals and objectives was to 
uh, receive and place and service the new ladder track, which we have done in the community. And we're very grateful for that, and that has taken a lot of pressure off of us. Uh, the, we had an evaluation done over the past couple of months from a third party vendor that came in through a Maya grant uh, that helped us um, purchase that service. And they came through and kind of did a third party outside look at the fire department to right size the fire department fleet and how our operational model is. So uh, the, the first part of this is to put together a truck committee to work with the deputy. The deputy chief of operations um, works to work on procurement and uh, put together the bid specs for what we're going for in the future uh, in the department for uh, capital purchase such as this. Uh, so I work very, very closely with him and with the committee on that. So to put together a, uh, a new configuration of uh, a rescue pumper that will uh, meet the current needs of the fire department and the current NFPA standards for fire apparatus, uh, that's uh, a number one priority. Um, the other day, unfortunately, uh, we had a truck out for its preventive maintenance service. So we're using the, the engine that we procured from another community na neighboring us. Uh, that 1994 truck, and when they went to start the truck, the, uh, the starter actually blew apart. Luckily, it was able to get to the call and return to the station without event, and we got it fixed um, pretty quickly, but those are things that happen when you have uh, aging trucks um, that, are, that are highly technical. So, uh, and then work with the town manager and the finance uh, director to procure that through a competitive uh, consortium type of bidding process. So there are a number of those at our, uh, our disposal that we can um, get the most bang for the buck for that. So that's, that's the first. Uh, the second sure. is uh, the implementation. Before, before you go to your second goal, um, you had a discussion with Representative Maselli about getting reimbursed for the ladder truck and possibly, and or possibly getting funding for the next vehicle. You want to just touch upon that? He, Yes, he, he was more inclined to think that the community would be, it would be an easier sell, so to speak, and I think it's a hard sell either way uh, for the community get, to get reimbursed for the ladder truck uh, as, to, as opposed to uh, funding for a new engine. So uh, he's putting that uh, effort forward to try on behalf of the community and the fire department to do that, so. The state bought the last ladder truck for us because of the state hospital, so. Right, back in 1986. The reimburse for the ladder truck or purchase right. the engine, so. That's the approach he decided to take, okay. That's what he seemed to indicate to me is that was a more viable option for him uh, to go with uh, of those two options for, for reimbursement that way, so. Um, the second is uh, implementation of a, you, well, I just have a question regarding that. Um, we all, all know that um, it's important to keep in touch with our legislators about this through you, Mr. Chairman, to the town manager. If we could have, find out when Mr. Maselli is doing this so that if he needs phone calls to go to um, other people to help support that. I know that when the last fire truck was purchased by the state for this, um, that there was quite a undercurrent from Tewksbury that came forward um, in terms of the needs of the state hospital. And basically, um, back in 07, I actually um, submitted legislation on unfunded mandates because of state hospital, because we're not collecting taxes for that, but the services that we're providing to them are significant so if we need to do that again I would like to help in that effort because it is an outreach effort just by him putting it forward he needs some um, as someone said earlier some push from his constituent base to help him get it across the finish line and the fact that the state hospital is here and has a large um, use of our public services is very beneficial so we should probably start getting run times and things like that if he is getting that prepared. So I would ask that we work on that. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Absolutely. The uh, implementation of a full-time training coordinator uh, that was approved in the FY18 budget is uh, something we have been working in in the FY17 budget. 
uh, to improve and standardize our training programs. That is an ongoing process. Uh, we've made great strides in that uh, over the past several years, but in particular this past year, and that was uh, through a lot of uh, help and effort of the, the operations deputy to, to uh, oversee that and push that forward. Now with the training officer, that full-time committed training officer, we are looking forward to doing a lot more hands-on activity, hands-on training, specialized training uh, for our firefighters. Um, uh, it also goes into uh, helping uh, to mentor and encourage people to um, know their jobs and, and the ability to do their jobs. You know, at any given time, uh, fire departments can be called on to do any number of things. Um, just the other day, we got a call up at Merrimack Meadows for, um, it, it was a service call, and I tend to, when I look through the fire logs, look at those service calls to see what those are because then, um, not your run-of-the-mill medical call or, or fire or accident. So uh, call, I happened to look at that one, and um, it was a, uh, a rescue of a dog from a leash. A uh, dog got entangled in the leash. The homeowner or the, the owner of the dog uh, had no idea what to do. The dog bit her, uh, and which was c completely uncharacteristic of the dog. So she had she didn't know what to do, so she called the fire department. So three guys went up there. Uh, two of them took care of holding down the dog while the third person cut away the, uh, the, the, the leash from around uh, the dog's leg and, you know, I think saved the dog's leg, you know. So anybody that has pets knows how, you know, devastating that can be. They're part of your family, so you, you never know what you're going to get called to. That, that's for sure. So uh, we have to train for all hazards and... Um, uh, all types of rescues of, you know, people and, and pets, too, uh, in this particular case. Uh, the third is a succession, plan, a succession plan for the chief and deputy chief uh, for uh, our departures at some point in the future. Uh, we don't have any immediate retirement plans. However, uh, civil service has turned around, and part of that unfunded mandate that we talked about a little bit, um, a little bit earlier, they are doing away with the chief fire, um, the chief officer exam on a statewide level. The number of uh, civil service fire chiefs has diminished to the point where it's not cost effective for them to put forward tests on a yearly or every year basis. So uh, they've canceled uh, the recent test and they're not quite sure if they're going to schedule another one. So that's in the, in the fire chief um, category, and that's how Tewksbury has traditionally uh, selected their fire chief is by examination. So if the examination's not there, we have to have some plan going forward uh, to be able to um, fill that position. Down to the deputy chief level, uh, with Boston, Lowell, Holyoaks, uh, some of your bigger cities, they still have deputy and district chiefs, so there's still a profit margin, so to speak, for civil service to have those tests, um, to be able to, to sustain those uh, in the short term. But speaking with their operations director today, he wasn't even so sure that that was going to continue either uh, on that level. So going to uh, an assessment center type of process is something that uh, I think that we should have in place uh, so that, you know, if something should happen down the road, retirements or anything else, that there is a plan in place that uh, is not going to be a timely um, make it up as you go type of thing. It's something set. And what it will do for the department is we can develop minim minim minimum qualifications for our members now, for people that want to promote from within so that they have a target that they can look for and something that they can uh, educate and better themselves and get professional development for the future if they aspire to be a, a, a deputy chief or a chief uh, in the community. I think we have a lot of great candidates here locally and uh, I'd like to support them in trying to get them up and ready and, and running for, um, for those positions in the future. So uh, to work with the, uh, the town manager to implement that type of system is something that I think is very important and that's uh, in my FY18 uh, goals and objectives. Um, and then uh, lastly, the regional dispatch center and the new fire station continue, continue the development of that. Uh, that is, um, you know, I, having the operations deputy in the department and a fire prevention officer working, doing fire prevention and having the operations deputy has made a tremendous difference in the operation of the department where it, these are only a few of the goals and objectives. 
that we have in the department. There are dozens more that we have going at any given time in different states uh, within the department to move forward uh, with different uh, tasks and task groups that we have, uh, for different task groups that we have. Uh, and that is something that uh, having that operational dep deputy is a, is a, a huge benefit. Uh, the, the regional uh, emergency communication center, we've been meeting uh, with the town managers and also with the, uh, the public safety chiefs to organize and move this forward. Uh, as that pro process moves forward, the process for selecting an architect to, to begin the design process for the center fire station is going to run kind of concurrently with that. So there's a lot of great things that have been happening here over the years and Mr. Johnson talking about the uh, the years of hardship and uh, financial uh, distress that the communities and the region and the state were under. Um, it's it's night, in, night and day and we've had a lot of great things in this community, you know, in the community and especially in the fire department and we very much thank the community for, for their support. All right, well thank you. Uh, we'll open up to uh, any questions we have on the board, Mr. Kelly. I don't, thank you, Chief. Just a comment. Number four is like a full-time job in itself, I think. Um, and, and that's really all. So fantastic job, and thank you. Thank you. Mr. Stark? No, I would just like to um, thank you and your um, team for all of their hard work. I was on my way to work this morning and noticed them practicing on the ladder truck. Um, it's pretty impressive. Uh, I don't know if they were have a stopwatch at the end, but um, it's very impressive to see them doing that work um, at the firehouse every day as I drive by. So thank you for their work and Great. Um, thank you for all your hard work on um, getting the outreach out to our community on the center fire station project. Appreciate thank that. All right, Mr. Johnson. Um, just uh, one comment. I just want to thank you, Chief, for. Um, for your um, uh, mm. summary this evening, but I also want to acknowledge, I know you provided us with your um, uh, prior year, last year's uh, fiscal 17 goals and the status on those and, and where you are. So um, I just wanted to recognize that because uh, while we have asked you to cull those down, I know you mentioned you have many, many more, um, bringing these down to you know three or four um, concise goals for at a macro level um, there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes and it's pretty evident from the year-over-year -year progress that's um, been the focus of some of these discussions that a lot goes on and is much appreciated so thank you for <coughs> supplying us with um, kind of state of play with respect to last year as well thank you chief I just have uh, one question for you um, on first congratulations on the new station um, and tell you uh, fellow uh, firefighters that we apologize it took so long to get it but uh, you know something's good it's coming on their way I know they didn't complain about <clears throat> how bad it was and uh, you know now we have something to look forward to but um, I noticed that the number of it seems like every five minutes I'm hearing a truck going up and down the road it seems like that I mean you constantly deploy is it, it and it's not fires it doesn't seem like so is it, it seems like we're getting a lot of calls for medical assistance that are going in through the community or is it the call volume is definitely steady and increasing uh, we are busy on a regular basis uh, we do on a basic medical call, send the nearest engine company. For most medical calls, the nearest engine company and the ambulance. Uh, and there's a couple of, couple of reasons for that. Uh, one of them is um, a quick response and for, for the closest person uh, or engine company to get there to assess the situation and then upgrade or downgrade the response is beneficial. Uh, whenever there's lights and sirens, you know, going on in town, I kind of cringe a little bit because that's one of our biggest liabilities is getting to the calls uh, because the size of the apparatus and um, using lights and siren, requesting that right away from the motoring public and with people texting and the way cars are insulated now and the sounds, uh, that's that's always a concern. So, you know, the guys do a fantastic job of getting two calls safely. Um, there are 
a lot of calls, and uh, there are a lot of medical calls. Uh, we do do a lot of inspections also. Uh, the, the trucks do have, uh, we do spend a lot of money on maintaining our vehicles, on preventive maintenance, uh, and you know, making sure that the guys have the right tools and equipment to be able to effectively do their jobs. So to answer your question, there, there are more calls. You say not as many fires. We can't predict the amount of fires that we're going to have through the course just, of the year, but, like, you know, I, I, but we are going to have fires at some point. Uh, we will have them. Uh, what I think uh, in this community having a, 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 an effective response, uh, the way we have our deployment and having an effective response, if you have a $400,000 house, and you have a $5,000 loss of, of a kitchen, well, that's a $395,000 save. So uh, looking at it that, that way, if you can keep those responses um, appropriate and the incident small from the beginning, it's better for everybody. So, um, so you don't see, uh, you know, I mean, we did obviously uh, across the street here a couple of weeks ago, we saw a house that was fully involved very quickly. Fires are, um, much different than they were uh, than years past, and there is a concerted effort for uh, health and safety of firefighters, and a lot of that's going to go into the new station design also. Um, taking that into consideration, the fires that fires, firefighters are responding to now are full of toxins and gases and things that can kill you, um, you know, in the short and the long term. So the cancer rates for firefighters is, uh, is, is much higher uh, than it has been in years past in percentages. Uh, I think Boston is coming out and making strides in improving that, and uh, that goes right down through the fire service. So we're taking every effort, and that's gonna be one of the focuses of the training officer is to make sure that our members, and part of going to the new SCBA that we went to with some of the safety, built-in safety factors that that has um, built into it, um, to lessen that risk, you know, for our firefighters. Um, just, you know, I talk about the succession planning of the deputy and the chief, and I'm not gonna tell you what my age is by any stretch, but uh, our captains, the average age of our captains right now is 55 years old. Firefighters can retire 55, ye uh, 55 years old, 32 years on the job. They mandatory retirement at 55, so um, the department is in a transition now. And every 20, 25 years, we go from a young department to a little bit more senior department, and then it flips, you know, back and forth. So we're in one of those cycles right now where we have a lot of retirements, we're losing a lot of very senior firefighters, and we're bringing in a lot more, I would say younger, but more work savvy, new firefighters coming in. A lot of the people that are coming in are military, uh, so they have military experience, so that kind of takes away some of the, uh, the training aspect of discipline from, you know, when you have that type of work experience coming in. So a little bit more savvy uh, employees coming in. Uh, the average age in the department right now is about 44 years old. The officers with the captains and the lieutenants is about 52. The average, fire, the average firefighter age is 47, and the average EMT age is about 35 years old. So the department is on that upward swing, and I do see that over the next, you know, five to seven years kind of swinging the other way. So as a lot of the people that came on around my era start to, uh, start to retire and, and move on for the younger people. So. Well, on behalf of the whole board, um, you know, thank you for all your, all your great work, um, and we appreciate your update. So thank you very much. Thank you. <coughs> all right. Let's see where we stand here. All right. Uh, we're in the resident portion of the. Uh, residents that would like to come forward and speak okay seeing none um, we're gonna move on to uh, we get a disclosure disclosure by a municipal employee um, mr. chairman I would make a motion to um, approve the uh, disclosure by Janice Judd who is apparently a new employee in the town's clerk's office and uh, 
will be periodically working as a reserve dispatcher. Mm -hmm. I second the motion. Okay. I got a motion or something? Do I have Discussion. a question? Discussion. I, ju yeah. I just want to note for the record that these um, will be uh, outside of her normal work hours, which she disclosed in her. I just want everyone to know she's not going to be yeah. um, doing one and then doing the other. Oh, okay. Thank That's you. Well noted. Okay. I have a motion and a second. All in favor, please state and say aye. Aye. Chair votes aye as well, so that passes unanimously. All right. Uh, the fifth item on our agenda is a second annual uh, run for recovery on Sunday, September 17th. It's uh, the interaction. Um, they're looking <coughs> to permission to run a in their second annual 5K on Sunday. They're planning to start at nine o'clock and uh, be done by 11. Uh, the uh, will be going by the Tewksbury High School, follow the route of uh, pretty much the Megan McCarthy Road Race, and uh, uh, we have we have information from the. Uh, I believe the safety officer said we have something from the town office that they were okay with this. So at this time, I'll take any motions on this. Mr. Chairman, I'll offer a motion to approve the road race subject to the conditions laid out by the safety officer in her 5-8 letter. Yep. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second? I have a second. Second. Okay. All those in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Chair votes aye as well. That passes. Okay. Uh, Okay, now we have a uh, post, uh, posting a vacancy for the Zoning Bylaw Committee. Mr. Chairman, um, as I discuss this particular um, item, it's probably a good idea to discuss item number 12 at the same time mm -hmm. and maybe then segue into item number 7 because they all kind of dovetail. Um, item 6 is in regard to posting a vacancy that we have on the Zoning Bylaw Committee, but also under item 12, I wanted to just discuss the upcoming board, boards and committees appointment process the board has. Yep. Um, there are two parts to it. Uh, the first part um, of that process um, has already started. We have notified um, all of the individuals um, who have terms expiring June 30th um, that they need to indicate if they want to be reappointed. Um, I think over close to 50 letters have already gone out to those individuals. Um, almost half of them have already responded that they would like to be reappointed. Um, and we've given a deadline to those individuals to respond to us by June 3rd. So the board has that information for the June 6th meeting. Um, so with that, uh, so I just want to make sure that's, that's uh, that process is okay. Um, and then um, with that, um, the second part is to post any vacancies on committees, um, which we do have in addition to those people that are interested in uh, being re, uh, um, reappointed. So we, I would like to move forward and post um, all the vacancies that we have on committees, which would include a vacancy on the zoning bylaw committee. Um, and when we discuss the restructuring of the housing, uh, local housing partnership committee, there'll be vacancies on that also. And if it's okay with the board, I'd like to have those posted this week and have applicants submit their interest uh, again by June 3rd so the board has that information for their meeting on the 6th. So I just want to run that by the board. All right. Um, any discussion? Mr. Ronick? I, I just <coughs> have a question. Um, I just want to be clear, um, Mr. Montori. You're asking for us to um, post the vacancy of not just the zoning bylaw in the local housing partnership, but any other vacancies um, that are currently on any other boards in the? Correct. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Johnson, have any questions? No, I'll make a motion to adopt the plan that the town manager presented, Mr. Chairman. And I'll second that. Okay. So we have a motion and a second. All in favor, please state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? And the chair votes aye as well. So. And, we'll, and we'll gather all of the information for those individuals who want to be um, reappointed and those uh, that have interest in the committees and I'll have them to you uh, prior to your meeting on the 6th and then on the 6th you can decide if you want to reappoint those who applied for reappointment and if you want to interview any future candidates. Oh, I, I want to thank you and your staff. You've been doing a wonderful job keeping us all updated <coughs> on uh, what's going on. Uh, I've received numerous emails 
about you know the letters going out and uh, the Excel sheets that you put together. If we could just, uh, as we have that uh, Excel sheet, just update, put something on there that say reapplied or something like that. So definitely, we, then there was, we'll know where we stand. So when we have to schedule these meetings, we, we'll have a better idea of how early we have to start or you know how many meetings so we will have to. We can do that definitely to do, to do that. And then, so that brings me to item number seven, which is the reconfiguration of the local housing partnership, which is something that um, we've been working on for quite some time, probably longer than we probably should have been. Um, and I apologize that this wasn't done sooner. Um, but the local housing partnership met um, uh, on May 11th. Uh, the assistant town manager, uh, Steve Sadwick, uh, was at the meeting. I know um, Selectman Stronach was at the meeting also. And uh, it was decided that night that the committee would um, indeed uh, be reconfigured um, from its current 11-member structure down to a seven-member structure. And the new seven-member structure would consist as follows. A member uh, or representative of the Housing Authority, a representative of the Conservation Commission, and a representative of the Planning Board, and four um, residents, all of which would be voting members. And then the um, Board of Selectmen will remain as an advisory member. So that would bring it to eight, I believe, Anne-Marie? That, um, that is correct. And the Selectmen, the non-voting member, would be able to be an alternate in the um, case of that there was not a quorum. Um, and I believe that we talked about that. It is on here. Um, that it would be an alternate. But it was stated by the um, town attorney um, that we have to be clear that if the Board of Selectmen does um, engage in any action on that committee, if there's something that's going to come before the board, we um, cannot take action. So we can be there in terms of representation to have enough members to meet, but we cannot necessarily vote on an item that's going to be coming before us as a body that we're going to have to approve later on. So we would have to take an abstention. <clears throat> that's correct. So that'd be the new reconfiguration. We currently have seven voting members. Seven voting members. We currently have um, residents on the committee. We have, I believe, two, and that would um, require us to fill two vacancies that we would advertise this week. And then the Conservation Commission. Planning Board and Housing Authority would designate their individual members. Any discussion? Mr. Chairman, just one question, just for clarity's sake. Um, that sounds fine to me, but for the purposes of a quorum, that, if I understand it correctly, you're saying that a four, um, four voting members would constitute the quorum. Correct. Is that right? That's correct. Okay. Thank you. In can I just make one other comment? Um, when we were talking about this at the local um, partnership meeting, we know that there has not been a school committee member that's been, but they're more than welcome to come to any of these, and the same thing with the Board of Health. So we will notify those boards um, of when those meetings are, when we get a, month, we'll get a yearly schedule together mm -hmm. um, next year, But so they will have that information. We don't want but these, those, vac those positions have been vacant for years, according to the committee. So I just want to state that for the record. I'd like to make a, uh, a motion to adopt the local housing partnership reconfiguration. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Chair votes aye as well. That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay, um, so that took care of six, seven. Now we'll, um, uh, number eight is the update traffic studies on Andover, Ripple, and Shawshank. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Superintendent of Public Works had to leave, or he would have stayed to discuss this, but he, had, he didn't realize we were going to go this late and he had to leave. Um, but just uh, a quick update. Um, we've been doing uh, traffic studies um, on um, Shawshank Street and Andover Road um, and uh, on Whipple Road. And TEC Consultant has been doing the um, traffic studies for us to submit to the um, 
the Commonwealth uh, Mass DOT for review and approval. Um, TEC has um, provided um, a report to us with uh, their study data at this point. They haven't finalized the whole report. And right now, um, the data supports petitioning the state to post 35 miles an hour, 35 mile an hour speed limit on Andover Street. Uh, currently, the western, western end from the lower line to Troll Road is 40 mile an hour zone. Uh, and then from the power lines to Andover line, the speed limit is 45 mile an hour. So uh, our intent, uh, even though this is a significant reduction, is to petition the Commonwealth for the lower speed limit. And if the Commonwealth thinks it should be higher, they can tell us that. But we're not going to, we're going to ask for the lowest that this data shows us. Um, they're still working on uh, crash data, data from the police uh, to get uh, from the police department to the uh, consultants, which I believe they've already done that, um, and they'll uh, move forward with that uh, that work. Um, so um, they've been uh, working on the uh, the uh, the plans and the report, and once we complete it, um, we'll submit all of that to uh, the state uh, and push for uh, implementation based on what we believe the uh, speed lower speed limit should be. Thank you. Anybody have any questions? Just, just for clarity's sake, that just is Andover Street, however, right? Yes. So the other two are still in play? Still in play. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. All right. Well, thank you. All right. Uh, the next item is the uh, safety improvements and update on the intersection of Salem and Salta. I'm just going to put a graphic up on the screen. I think I passed out a plan to everyone. <laughs> Do this right. <laughs> the wrong way, of course. I think so I can do this right. So this is a conceptual plan that was put together uh, by TEC, by TEC, who is um, it's, upside uh, it's upside down. Still, give me a second. So this is the conceptual plan for the new layout uh, of the improvements to um, the intersections uh, at um, Shawshee and Maine, um, um, Salem and um, South and Salem, and uh, South and Maine. And um, this is a conceptual plan that was uh, presented. Uh, more work has been done, and we've submitted our 25% uh, design uh, to the Commonwealth. Uh, for these improvements, and uh, we're waiting for some feedback uh, and review, and then we'll then we have to put a more um, definitive schedule together. Um, the funding for this project um, has been uh, town funding of the design, and the state will be funding the actual improvements of these intersection improvements and these roadway improvements that will include uh, intersection improvements, widening of uh, uh, um, roads for turning lanes. Uh, signalization. Um, the funding will come from the Commonwealth on the Transportation Improvement Plan, and we've been fortunate enough to see this project moved up. I believe it was originally for 2020, and it's been moved up to 2019. Uh, so that has been great news. So we're pushing this forward uh, to get the design complete uh, and do this uh, project as soon as we can. So this is a conceptual layout that was presented during a uh, scoping session or a, a 25% uh, uh, public comment review session uh, that was here held here at the town hall, uh, but this gives you an idea of what uh, not just the intersections on Main Street will look like, but what the intersections um, uh, on South and Salem will look like also. Any questions on that? Would it be? Um, would you consider? Or would there be a public hearing, Mr. Monturi, um, or is this kind of set in stone? So I, I did have some residents. Um, I think we already had one. There will be another public comment uh, period uh, once the state approves the 25 design, 25 percent design plans. The state will come back out and do another public comment uh, period on it. Okay, and that that's where um, the residents could voice their any concerns or any thoughts on the design. Very good, thank you. Mm -hmm. I I would like to say that um, I actually attended that. It was a very well attended meeting. This is an area of grave concern 
to um, our residents, not just that are in that area that use that coming home from work. So um, I want to thank everybody's work on this. I'm sure you have some comments. Mr. Johnson, for you. Just uh, through you, Mr. Chairman, to the town manager, um, on South and Salem, um, what's the status of a potential traffic signal there versus mm -hmm. the plan that's before us here where it says investigate? Uh, I'll get an update on where they are in the investigation. I, um, I haven't heard, uh, and I looked at the most updated designs today. I still think they're working on that data, but I'll find out. Yeah, and then, um, as, as I've discussed with uh, numerous people on this, I believe that the plan is to put a fully operational signal in there. Uh, I think that that plan is mocked up that way because they had three concepts. There was a rotary and some other things, and I think that's why this plan may have just been mocked up there, but the, this is the 60th worst intersection in the Commonwealth, so they, I think that the, the reason behind this is to put a fully action signal in there. Um, I do like the fact that they're extending out onto the other intersections, widening down there, and they are going down to uh, a portion of uh, 38. Uh, I had a conversation with the town manager earlier this week. It appears that the state has some funds available uh, that they're trying to spend to do some resurfacing in spots. And so I was going to reach out to um, and have a discussion about sending a letter to our state senator from the board. Uh, requesting that uh, to see if there would be any funding available this year to be able to uh, tie where this project ends off of just like by where Walgreens is uh, from that portion to the Wilmington town line. It appears they may have some funds available to be able to do what they're spending. They're doing a number of resurfacing projects. Uh, there's some NFA money available. And so I think it would be uh, best interest to request that uh, since it would tie into an existing project and send something in and just ask the senator to uh, reach out to the uh, uh, transportation secretary to see if this is something that we can ask for and have to take care of another portion of Route 38 and then we'd get through that and as everyone knows we have another project coming up uh, that's uh, going to be going through the town center a couple of years afterwards so we'll be able to take care of quite a bit of 38 uh, that's need well needed to be resurfaced. So. And just on, on, since we're talking about DPW projects, I just want to note that tomorrow we'll be opening RFPs for our updated, uh, to update our sidewalk plan. And um, once we uh, finalize a contract with uh, a, comp a firm to update the sidewalk uh, plan that the town has, uh, we're also going to be moving forward for funding through the Complete Streets program to do some sidewalk work in town. And we'll uh, start utilizing the $250,000 that we have already appropriated for um, sidewalks in the community. So um, after tomorrow, we'll start um, focusing focusing even more on sidewalks within the community as the residents want. Okay. Um, and also uh, in regard to our work on Route 38, um, we're solici soliciting proposals from engineering firms to design um, water main improvements along the uh, parts of Route 38 that we know the state's going to be coming in and doing some work. So we get our work done before they do any work. So we're doing that also the, in the next few days. And, and the way these projects work, uh, I mean, as you can see, thanks to this consultant that was working on this uh, Salem and Salt that went out there, they, uh, you know, convinced that they could get this project moved forward if they could move it up. And uh, as I've seen in numerous times, projects slip, projects move forward, and uh, the faster that we can get our infrastructure done, you know, there may be a funding that comes available sooner that they may be able to get out there and as long as we stay on top of it you know we got a 25 percent plan in and we do our work um, you know this could actually come quicker than expected but it'd be all great news if we can get the town work done uh, the uh, we move on mr. chairman just to comment um, I wholeheartedly support your suggestion of requesting um, any available funds that we can leverage, but I would ask that any correspondence be sent to our complete state delegation. Yes, absolutely. Um, we're equal opportunity requesters here in Tuxbury, yeah, no. so um, we, we don't want to discriminate and choose one over another. No, I, no, that's, that's I think fine. we should be sending that correspondence to the entire delegation. Yeah, that's, that sounds fine, absolutely. Uh, the only other last comment, I, I spoke to you about the sidewalks and just updated on that. Um, I am getting a lot of calls from residents asking about 
That seems to be the big thing in town. It's sidewalk, sidewalk, sidewalks. Where are they going? Um, once that plan is made available, is that something that we could put up on our website of like this is where we're starting? <coughs> and you know, because I'm, I'm sure people are going to yeah. be asking, well, why are we doing here? Why are we doing there? Why are we doing there? I'm once sure the plan's updated on the most dangerous roads, and yeah, I think we could put the plan on the website, and I would um, also uh, I'll be planning to have the um, DPW. Um, and the consultant make a presentation to the board on what their findings are. All right, excellent, thank you. All right, any other questions? All right, uh, so uh, I'm gonna put, present a motion to uh, send a uh, letter to our delegation um, requesting funding to, uh, for resurfacing that portion of 38. Uh, if we could send a letter into them. Do I have a second on that? I'll second that. All right, all in favor? Say aye. Aye. All right, any opposed? Okay, chair votes aye as well. All right, um, so if we get through that. Now the, last, the next thing is uh, McHugh Trust Affidavit. I think in the packet there is a, um, an affidavit that the board needs to sign. Um, this has to do with um, a land uh, transfer that was done, I believe, in the 1960s where the town deeded land to the uh, congregational church across the street. And when they um, transferred the land, the name of the church was wrong. What this affidavit is doing, and, and they're doing a confirmatory deed, is to just ensure that the proper name of the church is on there. I'll make a. I'll make a motion to approve the affidavit, the signature of the affidavit by the board as presented, and um, I believe that council reviewed this. Yes, council reviewed it uh, Just so and, is, and is recommending approval. All right, I have a motion. Do I have a second on this? Second. Second. All right. All those in favor, state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye as well. Do we have a um, copy of this other than in the package? Is that right? Aye. Uh, aye. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, we already went over 12. Uh, that was the upcoming committee, so. Uh, Next thing we have is town manager um, nope, portion yep. of this. There is one thing that was added to the agenda under new business, a um, oh, the uh, liquor license hearings. So I just want to update the board on two things. Um, first, the hearings are going to be on June 6th, starting at 7 um, p.m., um, five minutes apart, I believe. Um, but uh, I would ask that the board add a, um, there are four package stores that will be coming in. Um, I'd ask the board uh, set a hearing up for a fifth establishment, which is a restaurant um, who um, was cited for serving underaged um, individuals. And I'd ask the board to set a hearing for June 6th at 720 for Chopsticks Express Chinese Restaurant. So moved, Mr. Chairman. I'll second that. Okay, so we got a motion and a second. All those in favor, please state by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. Chair votes aye as well. So we'll have the four um, stop meeting and then uh, the chopsticks. Uh, with the uh, with that, I, I know that we had some correspondence from uh, from the story that it appears that they were getting complaints to the police department that this was an ongoing problem. So will we have some uh, information from the police department yes. on their investigation into this. Yep, and there will be a representative of the police department here that evening. Excellent. Okay. Thank you very much. All right, now we are on to number 14, the town manager's portion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'll be brief. Um, two invoices for town council services, uh, the first from April 1st to April 15th in the amount of $4,037.50. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. Okay, so we get approval for the town council invoice for April 1st, April 15th. All those in favor, please state by saying aye. Aye. All any opposed? Chair votes aye as well. Uh, the second invoice for the services dated April 16th through April 30th in the amount of $2,295. Make a motion to approve. I'll second. Okay, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor of approving town council invoice by April 16th to April 30th, please state by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye as well. And um, the last two items uh, have to do with uh, transferring funds from the Affordable Housing Trust to pay for taxes uh, on um, two parcels of property that were transferred uh, to the Housing Authority. 
and when they were transferred, um, the intent all along was for the town through the Affordable Housing Trust to pay the taxes. Uh, the first was 48 Dewey Street, which is a house that's um, not too far from the town hall. Um, it was purchased using um, uh, affordable housing trust fund money to replace the house that we took down across the street from town hall for the uh, site of the new fire station, center fire station. At the time, there were outstanding taxes um, totaling uh, $2,318.80, which the housing authority paid, um, and they shouldn't have. We should have paid that from the trust. So the first uh, request that I have with the board uh, for this particular piece of property is to uh, transfer $2,318.80 from the Affordable Housing Trust to reimburse the housing authority for taxes they paid on 48 Dewey Street. I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman, as presented by the town manager. Okay, I have a motion. Do I have a second? Do I have a second? Yeah. All those in favor, please say by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye as well. And then uh, in regard to 48 Dewey Street, there are remaining taxes due uh, for the final quarter of the year in the amount of $1,137.82. And I would ask that the board transfer those funds from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to pay the taxes. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second for discussion. Okay. That is, completes the taxes that are owed on that property. I just. That is correct. And then next, starting July 1, it will be an exempt property. Perfect. And they won't be charged taxes. Thank you. All right, we have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Chair votes aye as well. And then the second um, house is on 80 Orchard Street. This was a house that was recently um, um, sold to the uh, Housing Authority, um, and they have outstanding taxes of $541.66. And I, was, I would ask that the board uh, transfer those funds from the Affordable Housing Trust Fund to pay the taxes. So moved, Mr. Chairman. All right, we have a motion. Do we have a second? We have a second. Okay, all those in favor, please state by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Chair votes aye as well. Uh, the number on that was 541.60? 541.66. 66, okay, thank you. Okay. All right, um, thank anything you. else that we have to? That is it, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, the next uh, thing we have is on minutes. So, we'll turn it to so Mr. Chairman, um, in my last official act as the clerk, I present the minutes for your approval for March 15th regular session and March 28th regular session. Okay, and we have, uh, we have also um, minutes from April 25th. Those, um, uh, yes, I can present those as well on okay. April 25th. Okay. Okay. I'll make a motion for all three of those to be approved. Okay. So we have a motion to approve the minutes, outstanding minutes from March 15th regular session, March 28th regular session, and April 25th regular session. So we have a motion on that? I mean, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. All right. All those in favor, please state by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? The chair votes aye as well. Those are approved. All right. Uh, we'll go to board member reports. I'll go to Mr. Johnson. You can start us off if you would. Uh, sure. Um, I just want to thank the community. This past Saturday was the annual Letter Carriers uh, food drive to benefit the Tewksbury Community Food Pantry. Um, and thanks to residents who took the time to leave uh, canned goods and other non-perishable foods by their mailbox for letter carrier pickup. Um, the town contributed uh, just under 10,000 pounds of food to the food pantry, which will support um, many people in town for the next few months uh, with food supply. So um, this is an annual national food drive. We're very fortunate here in Tewksbury to have um, uh, very enthusiastic support year over year. A lot of people make that happen, and uh, most importantly, the letter carriers who, um, in addition to their normal duties, uh, stop and get out of the truck to pick up food and bring that down to the pantry. So I want to thank um, all those who contributed to that in one way, shape, or form, and on behalf of those who um, benefit from the generosity of our community, um, thank uh, those who contributed on their behalf. Um, the second item um, I wanted to mention was, um, it's uh, probably not lost on people, 
uh, in the news the last few days, uh, there was a uh, worldwide uh, wanna cry ransomware event affecting uh, multiple countries around the world and many uh, institutions. So just as um, kind of a fiduciary responsibility that we have to ensure that um, the town's um, IT infrastructure is secure, I just wanna through the you, Mr. Chairman, um, ask the town manager to make inquiry of his technology staff and maybe at the next meeting just <coughs> give us a status on, on where we are. Everything I've read um, suggests that Microsoft products, um, there are upgrades, uh, software updates that will you know, prevent the problem, but I also know from past experience that uh, not everybody takes advantage of those updates, uh, whether it be in a commercial or a governmental setting or even at a home home environment, so we ought to make sure that we're doing everything we can to avoid um, any uh, issues with that We, um, from the standpoint of delivery of services to our town. Um, so I want to ask you to do that. Yeah, I can get, I can get an up, um, a more detailed update, but um, when it did happen, I contacted our IT um, manager, and um, on our end, we were secure. We had no issues. Uh, the most vulnerable um, products were uh, um, the operating system of Windows XP, right. and um, we've um, we've already switched out 98% of our machines uh, that have that. So I'll get more I'll get more of an update. But right now, uh, we're secure and haven't any issues. So it it kind of came to mind when uh, the library director was talking about um, some of her technology as well. So it raises the question in my mind of when we talk about the town. Is it all encompassing? Obviously, the schools manage their own systems, but um, all the town departments, when we, when we um, deal with our IT um, uh, manager, is that in all encompassing, or is it? Yeah, for, for the for the most part, the library has more specific network needs right. than what we have. That's why they have a technology man. Uh, they'll have a technology librarian of their own. Um, but Jamie Bent, who is our uh, IT manager, handles the overall infrastructure. Uh, police have a more sophisticated um, network also through the state, so they have their own uh, person focused on that too, but Jamie is kind of the overall structure. Okay, all right. Just, um, we ought to be certainly cognizant of that unfortunate yep. event. Um, and last comment, Mr. Chairman, just to be very brief. Um, as I was sitting here tonight, we were sort of reminiscing about um, economic downturn of a number of years ago. Some of us at this table um, have uh, labored at, at this table um, during those times. Um, it it kind of prompted in my mind um, recalling sitting in this room, which was a little bit larger, but uh, the windows rattled as trucks went by. This time of year, we had to open up the doors and um, to let some wind blow in and cool the building down. The room would fill with mosquitoes. Um, in the winter months, we had plastic draped over the windows. Um, the floors creaked. Um, I recall one evening, um, literally, the building shook um, because of an event outside. Um, so we are literally, um, I just want to take a minute and appreciate the fact that we get to come here in a um, much um, appreciated and updated uh, building, and we take it for granted um, sometimes when we uh, are here repeatedly and, and often, but um, it shouldn't be lost in our community that we've come a long way in many respects over the last 10, 15 years. Um, and with respect to this building, it's the heart of our um, municipal government. Um, and represents many things to many people, but um, we all should be very proud of um, the final product here as we continue to use it um, meeting after meeting and night after night. Every night I drive by here and the lights are on and someone's in here um, taking advantage of, um, of this building, which is a good thing to see. So that's all I have tonight, Mr. Chairman. Well, I can attest that it's very solid. <laughs> <laughs> um, I bet you can. Uh, all right, uh, Ms. Stronach. <laughs> okay, I will try to be brief. 
Um, thank you for your support of the housing partnership. We are working very diligently on our housing production plan, which expires this August and needs to be updated. It's basically our blueprint for affordable housing for the town of Tewksbury. So we're looking forward and we're working with NIMCOG. So I want to thank Jay Donovan for his work on that, as well as Steve Sabwick and the rest of the people in your office um, who don't attend the meeting. Our next meeting will be on June 8th and we've kind of tabled other agenda items that are on there to get this very important job completed. Um, the elementary building committee continues to meet weekly, subcommittees meeting in between those times that we're meeting, but um, we are right now in process of negotiating, um, hopefully a contract with the project manager. So we will be reconvening as a full board again on June 19th. And there'll be a lot of work going on before then, um, during that time. And I wanna thank the subcommittees for their work on that because they're putting in a lot of time and effort on that. It's a great committee. Um, wanna congratulate all of our graduates at Tewksbury Memorial High School. Um, June 2nd, we will not have the opportunity to meet before um, they graduate, so I wanna congratulate them on that. Unfortunately, I won't be able to be there, but I'm really excited about those um, individuals crossing that stage. It's a very exciting event. Um, the athletic field is being, um, at the high school is being dedicated to Ed Dick, a former colleague of um, the Board of Selectmen and a longtime school committee member. And that is going to be happening on May 24th at 4 p.m. And they're following it by a Redmond um, Drake it game right after. So that's gonna be quite the event. So, and then I would just like to also say that um, I know that we, I had asked for residents to put forward names for the Ginsburg um, presentation, and they did select the Palomino, um, Sandy and Phil Palomino, so I wanna thank them for their contributions to the schools that they have made. I know they honored them last week at their school committee meeting. And other than that, I have nothing else, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Kelly? I am good. Anne-Marie stole my thunder. <laughs> <laughs> you can say it too. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, if, if I can, um, I don't mean to interrupt my colleague. I, if you weren't finished, I'll wait. But I'm good. I thought you were done. Oh, okay, I apologize. Um, I, I forgot one item. I just wanted to mention um, a few weeks back, I attended at the VFW an event that involved two of our high school students um, that were recognized for um, an essay and also a um, recording, uh, audio recording, dealing with um, the subject of uh, democracy and um, you know freedom uh, under the United States. And one of them, um, a um, upperclassman at Tewksbury Memorial High School, um, is the daughter of uh, Vietnam immigrants. Um, so it was quite compelling, and her. Um, uh, presentation uh, made it to um, the national um, recognition stage. So um, something that um, very positive, um, but it was a regional uh, meeting of veterans, and um, as I know, we all appreciate um, their service. Um, I neglected to meet, mention that in my uh, my comments, so I appreciate the oh, courtesy absolutely. of well, letting me mention that. Gladly let you speak on that. It's a wonderful thing for the community. Yeah. All right, I have a couple of things. Um, the Beautification Committee met on Monday. Uh, they already came together tonight with their presentation. Uh, I want to thank everybody again that volunteered for the cleanup day. It was a great success. Um, economic, develop, uh, econo yeah, economic Development Committee, um, we haven't met because a number of the members are on other committees in the town. So since we've had the town warrants, everyone's been busy. But our next meeting is scheduled for June 12th. Um, Thursday, um, the town and uh, the chamber are having an event here uh, from 8.30 to 10 for Grow Your Small Business. Uh, I encourage any small businesses that are looking for information. Or to, it's going to be an informational thing for uh, people to start up their own business. Um, uh, the police bicycle rodeo is going to take place on Sunday, June 4th at the high school from 10 to 1. Um, that's something that's going to be happening. And 
We have, uh, we've been working on the Memorial Day Parade. Um, I think we're going to have a wonderful parade. We're the only one who had it last year. We plan on having it again this year. Um, the veterans agent I've met with a number of times. She's doing a wonderful job putting the ceremony together. Um, so that'll take place at 12, and then the parade will take place uh, beginning at 2. Um, the other thing, uh, David Gay is unfortunately couldn't meet us, be, be here with us tonight because of a private engagement. But I did notice along 38 that they're setting up the bus shelters, and he'll probably bring us up to date on that. I can see them putting the pads out there, sort of having shopping carriages and other things out there. 38 is a great improvement. And uh, one last thing I wanted to throw to the town manager uh, Mass DOT is having their capital plan meeting in Lawrence. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think it's coming up, uh, but uh, are we going to have somebody attend that? The town engineer will attend. Excellent. Yeah, that's, uh, that is uh, May 18th at 6 o'clock. Uh, so it's this, this Thursday that somebody should be going to. Yeah, I believe I the plan town engineer. Attended it also. They'll be talking about the, you know, the next full year, five year plan of what's going on. So it seems like a lot of communities come and try to push their projects. So mm -hmm. it would be nice to have a voice from Tuxbury mm -hmm. there. So excellent. And uh, pretty much that's all I have. So at this point, um, listen to any motions to adjourn. I'll make a motion to adjourn, Mr. Chairman. A second. I have a second. All those in favor say aye. Aye. We are adjourned. What time is it? It is. Um,